The subcommittee will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare recesses during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I now call, excuse me. Uh, we haven't had a hearing like this for some time, so it's way overdue. This morning we're discussing the transportation infrastructure needs of tribes, federal land management agencies, and the U.S. territories. This is our 10th subcommittee hearing. Uh, this work will enable us to hear from the stakeholders regarding policy changes, and particularly will it help us to elevate issues that have not received thorough consideration for nearly 20 years. 2002 uh, was the last hearing. These are significant programs. Under the FAST Act, tribal, federal land, and U.S. territorial transportation programs receive a combined $6.5 billion over five years. Today, we're going to hear from witnesses that federal investment has not kept pace with the needs of each of these programs. Surprise, surprise. Of particular con of concern in, in my district, for example, uh, there is a substantial maintenance backlog of national park services. And, Virtually all of our parks, uh, particularly our neighborhood parks, are National Park Service parks. While the National Park Service received $1.4 billion for transportation assets under the FAST Act, the agency's defer deferred maintenance backlog has grown to more than $11 billion. 1.4 received <laughs> a backlog of 11. $1.4 billion. Transportation needs constitute the majority of the backlog at over $6 billion. These figures only account for needed repairs and maintenance to existing transportation infrastructure, not to the future needs of the Park Service. I want to take a moment to thank members of this subcommittee who have highlighted the critical needs of these programs. Representatives Stanton and Davids have each made tribal transportation needs a top priority. Representative Plaskett of the Virgin Islands has championed infrastructure investment in the territories. And Representative Carbajal and others have supported increased funding for transportation infrastructure on our federal lands. So I look forward to hearing from today's panel and learning more about what this committee can do to ensure that transportation infrastructure needs of tribes, federal land and management agencies, and the U.S. territories are met. At this time, I would, uh, I would, I would like to ask our ranking member, Mr. Davis, uh, his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair Norton. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to today's hearing. Appreciate the opportunity to hear from each and every one of you. The programs we authorize in this committee provide $1.5 billion annually and account for 3.2% of all highway trust fund outlays. While I don't have, like Chair, like uh, Chairwoman Norton, I don't have tribal lands in my district. Um, I do have land managed by federal agencies like her uh, with the National Park Service. To put the overall $1.5 billion into perspective, the latest report from the NPS indicates a deferred maintenance backlog of $11.9 billion. Of that $11.9 billion, nearly $6.2 billion represents NPS's need to repair bridges, tunnels, parking areas, and roadways in national parks. Addressing the needs of those testifying today is absolutely linked to this backlog. As we address deferred maintenance, it will open the door for new projects and make the funding we authorize go even further. In Springfield, Illinois, 
located within my congressional district is one such new project that I've been working to get designated by the National Park Service as a National Historic Monument. The Springfield Race Riot National Historic Monument would, would preserve and protect resources associated with the 1908 Springfield Race Riot and its role in the formation of the NAACP. Uh, just to let the, my colleagues and the panelists know, you're, I'm gonna go show a short video, but the artifacts that are going to be mentioned in this video from the 1908 race riots were uncovered during an underpass project that was funded by transportation dollars. So with that, I'd love to turn the video on, please. In August 1908, two innocent black men were hanged in Springfield, Illinois. A mob of thousands, enraged by false claims that a black man had raped a white woman, burned down several blocks of homes and businesses in the black neighborhoods of Springfield. Many were killed. But the lynching of Scott Burton and William Donegan, both elderly, respected businessmen, were the most brutal acts of all. The 1908 race riot of Springfield the home of Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, was the catalyst for the birth of another legendary champion for racial justice, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. In 2014, crews digging along a railway corridor discovered the foundations of five of the original buildings destroyed in the riot. These sites will be carefully excavated. Their contents will be preserved and moved to safety. The foundations of the burned homes, too fragile to be moved, will remain interred and undisturbed. And this ground, and those who lived and died there, will be honored. The memorial will rise up from this site, giving voice to the men, women, and children who endured those dark days. The journey through the memorial begins along the Remembrance Garden boardwalk. This shaded path will introduce visitors to the Springfield of 1908. The events that led up to the race riot and the larger story of its effect and its role in the creation of the NAACP. At the center of the memorial is the wound, a 300 foot long metal sculpture with a large opening at its center. The opening is symbolic of a wound which the riot inflicted on the people and on the city and which remains open. Once inside, Visitors experienced the riot through the words of participants and witnesses. The savagery from a century ago slashes through time into this placid space. Pale brick floors trace the outlines of the skeletal foundations beneath. New walls rise from the ruins etched with the history of each home site. Near home site A, the running shape of the sculpture turns in upon itself to embrace a sacred marker. A bronze tree rises like a cross a solemn sculptural remembrance of the lynching tree whose branches were taken by the mob as souvenirs. A thin veil of water will cling to the tree, inviting one's touch, the healing nature of water and of time. Amid the strife and the pain, there is hope. A contemplation space rests at the end of this special place, testifying to acts of kindness, the giving of shelter, and offering visitors a respite for reflection a chance to appreciate the healing work done by the NAACP and countless others. This sacred place will become a destination and cultural landmark, welcoming the public and inviting them to enter this poignant story, seeking to educate current and future generations. I don't want to thank our witnesses, especially Mr. Picori, who's been working on this project, and I look forward to hearing everyone's testimony. I yield back. I want to thank the ranking member. That was very moving. I want to move now to the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. DeFazio. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> staff did some research, and we can't figure out when it was the last time this committee convened on these very important issues, uh, the federal agencies, tribes, the territories and uh, looked at the allocations they receive and the needs they have uh, and the inadequacy of what we have provided. So I'm, I'm very pleased we're here today. Uh, in the uh, FAST Act, uh, one of my top priorities was to have uh, tribal uh, transportation self-governance so they wouldn't be ripped off by the states 
or manipulated by the states uh, in the future, and uh, as they should, as uh, sovereign entities have uh, their own discretion in spending those funds. And it was a rocky road, uh, but uh, both, uh, you know, uh, Councilman Garcia and Ms. Clark uh, were involved in this process, and finally, after a couple of bad starts, um, my understanding is we've got it done, and we expect to see the rule in the very, very near future, so that, that's good news. Okay, now you got self-governance, but virtually no money, so uh, that's the uh, next uh, objective uh, before us. So, um, you know, the, uh, the death rate uh, on uh, on Indian lands in, in terms of pedestrians and uh, uh, driving accidents is, is horrible, uh, and the, the state of the infrastructure is abysmal. So uh, I'm hoping we can do a lot better in this reauthorization, and I'll be uh, happy to hear from, from you today. Uh, we also have uh, massive deficits uh, on our federal lands. Uh, Forest Service has uh, reported $3.6 billion backlog, Park Service $6 billion. Uh, just in my con congressional district for the Forest Service, it's about $100 million. Uh, these, uh, these needs uh, need to be addressed, uh, and hopefully, again, we can do better in this bill. And then finally, uh, we're going to uh, uh, revisit uh, the territory uh, issue, which has not been revisited for a couple of decades. Uh, it used to be the territories got a percentage share, uh, unfortunately, a number of years ago. Uh, they were set to a fixed amount of funding instead of a percentage share, and as, even as they've grown, uh, the funding uh, has not grown. And as their needs uh, have grown, uh, you know, the investment hasn't been made. Uh, and of course, we've had the, the disasters in Puerto Rico and in the Virgin Islands, and we're still trying to pry money out of uh, a number of federal agencies to deal with that. The committee will be uh, visiting in the near future uh, to both of those entities, and uh, we will see firsthand the lack of progress. So I, I think this is a very timely hearing, and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeFazio. I would like to welcome our witnesses. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Graves has an opening statement. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and I want to thank all of our witnesses for uh, being here today. And uh, I'll use my time uh, to yield to the Dean of the House, the former chairman, uh, who has a very big stake, his district has a very big stake in this. And uh, I'll yield to uh, Don Young. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mrs. Chairman, excuse me. Uh, this subcommittee, as has been mentioned, has been long overdue. Uh, I uh, have been participating when we passed TLU and the uh, part of the American Indians Alaska Native Transportation issue. And my goal here today is there's no place like Alaska in our country that demonstrates the nation's critical duty to invest in transportation infrastructure for all Americans, American Indians, Amer Alaska Natives, and federally managed lands. We have most of it in the United States and Alaska. And Alaska has 229 federally recognized tribes and with over 60% of Alaska lands federally owned, these programs are essential lifeline for the state and similarly situated states across the country. I recognize the attention these issues got and the chairman's moving forward framework. I want to congratulate him on that. Our nation is in dire need of these investments. However, I would be remiss if I did not state and get serious about the needs. We need to get serious about how to pay for these investments. I stand ready to work with the chairman, full chairman, the subcommittee chairman, and all the ranking members to try to achieve that goal. As the committee can be, begins to consider a service reauthorization bill, we must continue to build on the progress made in previous reauthorization to empower Native communities through self-governance and strive to create funding opportunities equal equality for small and large tribes. Currently, too many Alaskan tribes, due to their size, are unable to benefit from existing tribal infrastructure programs. The tribal formal program and discretionary programs should be stru structured to factor in the unique conditions of Alaska, including weather, existing infrastructure, and cost differences. Similarly, you cannot ignore the pressing transportation investment deficit on federally managed lands. I mentioned about the many parks and refuges we have in Alaska. In Alaska, Alaska federal land transportation infrastructure and parks, BLM, and the United States Fishery Service is essential for the mobility and commerce in the state. 
Alaska's national parks are a national treasure and deliver huge conservation benefits and economic benefits for the state of Alaska and for this nation. Keep them safe, open, and accessible is critical and important. These topics deserve the committee's attention. Again, congratulations for having this hearing. We need more public investment and interest in time. I would submit my suggestions to improve these programs for the record. Again, I want to thank the chairman and ranking member and all the members of this committee for holding this hearing. I have long sought to provide equality and equity, excuse me, and investment for our nation's native communities and rural infrastructure needs. We look forward to working with my colleagues on these issues moving forward. And remember, every time we have a meeting, my picture's looking down on you, and I hope you notice the biggest one in the House. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now I would like to welcome our witnesses, <clears throat> the Honorable Nelson Petty, PE Commissioner of Virgin Islands, Department of Public Works, Mr. Christopher B. French, Deputy Chief, National Forest System, United States Forest Service, U.S. Department of Agriculture, <coughs> Mr. Aaron Reef, PE, Transportation Program Manager, Office of Acquisition and Property Management, U.S. Department of Interior, Mr. Joe A. Garcia, Head Council Member, Okea Wanke, Pueblo, forgive me for obvious mispronunciations, Ms. Mary Beth Clark, President of the Tribal Transportation Association, and Mr. Sergio Sach Picori, Chief Executive Officer, Hanson Professional Services. I thank all of you for being here today and for the testimony. Before we hear from the panel of witnesses, I recognize Representative Plaskett to introduce Commissioner Perry. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank all of the members for being here. I have the privilege right now to expend, extend a special welcome and say I'm very pleased to have the Virgin Islands Commissioner for Public Works, the Honorable Nelson Petty Jr. among our panel of witnesses today. He has been responsible for the construction and maintenance of public roads and highways, public transportation systems, storm drainage systems, public buildings, and other facilities and infrastructure systems throughout the entire U.S. Virgin Islands under both Republican and Democratic administrations of our islands. He brings with him a wealth of hands-on experience with the federal surface transportation programs and their funding in the U.S. territories and has extensive uh, relationships with the other territories as well, along with his extensive previous experience as an engineer. I will not hold it against him that I understand he is a rattler. He went to Florida A&M where he um, did his studies, but he is our representative here on these issues and can answer as well uh, what some of the other territories are going for, and I thank you very much. I look forward to your testimony, sir. Thank you, uh, Representative Plaskett. Uh, without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. Since your written testimony has been made a part of the record, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Commissioner Petty, you may proceed. Good morning, Chair Norton, uh, Ranking Member Davis, Chair DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, members of the subcommittee, and other distinguished panel testifiers. Again, I am Nelson Petty, Jr., Commissioner of the United States Virgin Islands Department of Public Works. It is an honor to be here today to testify on behalf of U.S. territories. The territories are challenged because of our distance from the mainland. Resources such as aggregates for concrete and asphalt are limited and in many instances monopolized. Every major component in infrastructure development projects almost always must be shipped in, adding to project cost and time. For this reason, two years ago, in August of 2018, the territories met for the first time as a group at the U.S. Territor Territorial Pay Exchange in Lakewood, Colorado. This event was sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration. Those working sessions allowed us to share best practices and to learn of similar difficulties in managing our infrastructures. In the USVI, our ports are the gateway to our economy. Several, bu several billion dollars worth of commercial activity pass through our ports on an annual basis. 
In fact, the Caribbean ranks only behind Canada, Mexico, China, Japan, and the UK in US export part partners. The USVI is the first stop for much of the cargo that ends up in much of the lower Caribbean islands. This also applies for vacationers looking to visit other islands in the region. Knowing this, we developed and executed a transportation master plan that attempts to address the territory's transportation needs. In partnership with the Federal Highway Administration, we, de we developed the 2040 USVI Comprehensive Transportation Master Plan, the first long-range transportation plan of the territory. The vision statement of the plan simply stated, an integrated transportation system which serves the needs of the USVI community. The Virgin Islands Port Authority is also engaged in port expansion projects. Among them is the dredging of the inner Charlotte and Mali Harbor to allow for the larger Oasis class cruise cruise liners to continue to visit our ports. Another major project is the expansion of the Crown Bay Cargo ter Terminal, which seeks to increase the USVI's position as a regional and international transshipment hub. It has been proven across the globe that when infrastructure investments are made on the governmental side, private investments are sure to follow. Infra infrastructure investment also leads to employment opportunities and is be beneficial to and is a beneficial tool for socioeconomic stabilization. Mass transit provides one example where a substantial federal investment could provide spillover effects. Public transportation serves as a lifeline for many of our low-income residents who do not have access to their own means of transport. We are in the process of conducting a five-year review to evaluate our progress thus far, as well as to determine if any changes to the plan may be necessary, taking into consideration the impact of recent natural disasters. Following the passing of two Category 5 storms of 2017, Irma and Maria, as commissioner, I promulgated a new rule that stated that all local roads should be rebuilt to federal standards. FEMA eventually agreed with this and has adopted those federal standards as the basis for the rebuild of our local non-federal roads. The importance of this, of this cannot be overstated. It was clear after the storm's passing that roads built to those standards received minimal to no damage. As such, resiliency plays into every aspect of our rebuild. We have a unique opportunity with the profusion of recovery projects to be able to rebuild and transform our infrastructure. Our plan leverages the recovery dollars to rebuild and upgrade and seeks to utilize the federal highway funding to implement a pavement preservation program to ensure that those dollars aren't squandered. The program also utilizes technology as a tool to conduct condition assessments that allow for real-time data on our infrastructure. Our legislative branch is also working along with us to develop one dig legislation to ensure that all underground facility operators are given the opportunity to participate in upcoming projects and are included in project planning and development phases. It should be noted that we are also very much engaged in ferry boat operations, which is also critical to our inter-island commerce. USVI depends heavily on its ferry uh, system for daily commuters delivering goods and equipment, as well as our tourism product. This is an additional burden as it costs more to maintain transportation infrastructure in a community that depends on a ferry system. In 1998, 14.56 million was allocated to the USVI. In 2019, we received 16.8 million in federal highway funds. Over the last 20 years, the increase in annual allocation to the USVI has not kept pace with, with the increase in road construction costs. We are authorized by our stewardship agreement to perform engineering and economic surveys and investigations for the planning and financing of future highway programs. This is exactly why we are petitioning Congress. Our ports and roads are the gateway to a thriving USVI island economy. A thriving economy means less pressure on our healthcare system, our pension system, and other social services, meaning ultimately less is asked of our fellow US taxpayers and citizens to sustain our ter territory for the future. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Petty. We'll hear next now, we will hear next from uh, Mr. Christopher French, Deputy Chief National Aura System. Thank you, Chair Norton, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee. I, I thank you for inviting me here today, and I look forward to working with the subcommittee on these important issues. Today, I want to share with you the importance of the Forest Service Road Network, the largest network of any federal land management agency. And I want to be clear, my testimony is not about serving the Forest Service, it's about people. 
It's about rural America. It's about a way of life where our transportation system is the transportation fabric of the communities that we're a part of. Places like Red River, Idaho, Story, Arkansas, or Douglas County, Oregon. With that, I want you to remember three main things today. With over 370,000 miles of road, the Forest Service manages the largest transportation system of all the federal land management agencies. The Forest Service has over $5 billion in infrastructure repairs that we've not been able to fund, including $3.6 billion in deferred maintenance just for roads, bridges, and trails. Maintaining our roads is critical for emergency response, fire protection, connecting rural communities, supporting commerce in rural economies, and providing access to federal lands. For some context, the Forest Service manages over 193 million acres across 44 states, or about 8% of the land area in the United States. But in some counties, the National Forest System lands may represent more than 90% of the land base and the majority of that county's transportation infrastructure. This includes more than 65,000 miles of passenger, passenger vehicle roads and over 6,000 road bridges. This network provides the roads that people depend on to get to schools, stores, hospitals, their own homes. They are critical to their life. For example, in central Pennsylvania, a single Forest Service bridge is the only connector to a, a small subdivision of around 25 homes. That bridge is in such disrepair that the community fire trucks and emergency services cannot serve their homes presently. Our system is critical to our communities and of our multiple use mission. It provides access to more than 300 million hunters, anglers, and recreationists. These visitors contribute more than 11 billion to the U.S. economy and sustain, sustain nearly 150,000 jobs. Direct timber, grazing, and mining activities on national forests provides an additional almost 120,000 jobs and 13 billion to rural economies. Our roads support and connect people to thousands of sacred sites, 6,500 grazing permits, 30,000 recreation special use permits, they're critical to accessing 122 ski areas, 8,000 outfitter and guides, 400 resorts and marinas, 6,700 federal leases for minerals, and 300,000 permits to individuals to collect firewood or food collection or even Christmas trees. Um, it's also critical for subsistence hunting in states like um, Alaska and more than 1,500 communication sites that provide rural broadband and emergency response services to communities that we're a part of. And often, like counties, our roads are the gateways to national parks and monuments across the country. But perhaps most critically, this road network provides fire protection to communities. Firefighters and emergency responders use our roads to protect communities, evacuate families at risk, and rescue indiv individuals from danger. This is the number one issue I hear about from our county commissioners and residents. The need to maintain our road system to reduce the risk of fire, to attack fires early, and to maintain access that supports their way of life. When the Forest Service is forced to close on safe roads, it places limitations on our ability to access fires early before they turn into catastrophic events. Unfortunately, repairs and maintenance have been postponed year after year resulting in deferred maintenance up to that amount of 3.6 billion that I spoke about. This leads to more and more road closures across our systems because frankly, we just can't keep up. Our communities see this as failing them, or worse, as a strike to their liberty, liberty and way of life. To attain safe, sustainable access for the American public, our agency would require an additional 445 million per year over the next 10 years. We greatly appreciate the partnership with the Federal Highway Administration that Congress authorized most recently through the FAST Act. Through the, the uh, Federal Lands Transportation Program, the Forest Service currently receives approximately $19 million in annual funding. <clears throat> in fiscal year 20, that helped us rehabilitate 546 miles of roads and 29 bridges. It represents about 8% of our annual funds and about 3% of our estimated annual need. I'd be happy to work with the subcommittee, and I really appreciate the time this morning to talk about these important issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, Mr. Aaron Reef, uh, Transportation Program Manager at the Department of Interior. 
Chairman Norton, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Department of the Interior's Federal Lands and Tribal Transportation Programs. My name is Aaron Reef, Interior's Transportation Program Manager. <clears throat> Interior managed lands and facilities serve nearly 500 million visitors annually and provide schooling for approximately 47,000 Indian children. Within Interior, the National Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Land Management, and Bureau of Reclamation manage significant inventories of constructed assets, including transportation systems. In total, Interior is responsible for nearly 100,000 miles of road, nearly 4,000 bridges, 63 tunnels, 123 transit systems, and more than 50,000 miles of trails and primitive roads. Interior's surface transportation network is a key component of effective federal land management practices, including wildfire prevention and response and invasive species control. It also provides recreational access for Americans to hunt, fish, and enjoy other outdoor activities. These systems support local communities by facilitating the efficient movement of goods and services by small businesses, by allowing ranchers to move their stock to range land, and by providing equipment access to energy products. At the end of fiscal year 2019, Interior reported $17.3 billion in deferred maintenance and repair needs department-wide. Approximately one half of that total is related to transportation assets. At a time of record-setting visitation and rapid technological change, many key pieces of infra interior infrastructure, including iconic parkways, bridges, ferries, tunnels, trails, and bus fleets, have become functionally, functionally inadequate or have exceeded their design life and require large investments to bring them back to good condition. The Federal Lands Transportation Program, or FLTP, is authorized at $375 million in contract authority from the Highway Trust Fund in fiscal year 2020. And as a jointly administered program between the Federal Highway Administration and the federal land management agencies. For decades, this program has successfully played to the strengths of the partnership. Federal land management agencies are responsible for prioritizing multimodal transportation projects, and the Federal Highway Administration provides program oversight, verifies program eligibility, and provides technical assistance for delivery upon request. In carrying out the, the federal lands transportation program, Interior balances optimizing the life cycle of our existing infrastructure through necessary maintenance and capital improvements with our resource stewardship responsibilities. The FLTP is the primary funding source for major capital investments in interior transportation facilities. However, under other funding sources are also utilized, including fee revenue and annual appropriations to bureaus for construction, maintenance, and operations. Interior has identified annual transportation-related needs of approximately $1.1 billion per year to improve and maintain its transportation infrastructure in good condition meet modernization needs, and develop multimodal transportation systems. Transportation infrastructure is also a critical part of the well-being of tribal communities. Interior serves as a steward of more than 56 million acres of tribal trust lands. These lands contain more than 27,000 miles of road, 1,600 miles of trails, and approximately 1,000 bridges. The largest road program for tribal nations is the Tribal Transportation Program, or TTP, which is also funded from the Highway Trust Fund. During fiscal year 2020, the TTP is authorized at $505 million in contract authority, which is distributed by formula to all federally recognized tribes through self-determination contracts or, or agreements. Each tribal government prioritizes its own projects under this program. <clears throat> me. Accompanying the President's fiscal year 2020 budget for Interior is a reproposal of a public lands infrastructure fund that, if enacted, would generate up to $6.5 billion over five years to address federal infrastructure needs including deferred maintenance attributed to our transportation infrastructure. In conclusion, Interior's transportation system is critical to carrying out our mission to ensure visitor enjoyment, access, and safety, to protect natural and cultural resources, and to provide access for resource development and working landscapes. We thank this committee for continued support of these transportation programs. Without the FLTTP, FLTP and TTP, our ability to care for and provide access to these significant federal and tribal lands would be nearly impossible. We look forward to working with this committee and others as they consider legislation related to the administration propo administration's proposed Public Lands infra Infrastructure Fund and the reauthorization of the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act. Madam Chair, this concludes my statement. I would be pleased to answer any questions you or other members of the committee may have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reeve, for your statement. Next, Mr. Joe A. Garcia, Councilman O.K. Owinge Pueblo. Thank you, Tamo. Good morning. With all due respect, thank you, Chair Norton, Ranking Member Davis, 
and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to provide testimony today on the importance of service transportation for Indian country. My name is Joe Garcia. I'm head councilman and the former three-term governor of Okeowinge. I am an electrical engineer by profession with a BS electrical engineering degree from the University of New Mexico. I am the co-chair of the National Congress of American Indians, NCAI. Intertribal Transportation Association Tribal Transportation Task Force, a former two-term president of NCAI and the tribal co-chair of the Department of Transportation Negotiated Rulemaking Committee to establish the Tribal Transportation Self-Governance Program. Let me begin by thanking the committee and Chairman DeVazio for including Section 1121 in the FAST Act to extend tribal self-governance to the Department of Transportation. With your help, we have a consensus draft rule that will become final this June. We have some disagreement issues and concerns and timing issues because the timing when the department may establish an office of self-governance, whether the department might establish an advisory committee or pay tribes, contract support costs, and lease payments, but the draft rule honors self-governance principles, and this new program will benefit Indian country. Today, there are 574 tribal nations with a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the United States. 229 tribes are located in Alaska, and 345 are located in 34 other states. Indian country's 100 million acres would make it the fourth largest state in the U.S., with some 151,000 miles of roads, 42,000 miles of which are owned and maintained by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and tribes with too few resources. The transportation needs of Indian country, like rural America, are great. Please build on the improvements to the existing federal transportation pro programs proposed in the Senate Bill S-2302 including in its Title IV, which includes many provisions supported by tribes and NCAI. Tribes ceded millions of acres of their aboriginal land to the United States. In return, the federal government promised through signed treaties, statutes, and executive orders to extend its protection to tribal government and to our citizens. That is the binding contract the United States entered into with the tribes, from which has arisen the United States trust responsibility to the Indian nation and to our peoples. With too few federal appropriations, tribes are falling behind the rest of the nation and transportation barriers hinder economic growth. There are 29,400 miles of BIA system roads, the majority of which are gravel or earth and over 900 BIA-owned bridges. Tribal nations, and are, tribal nations own and maintain approximately 14,000 miles of tribal roads and trails, of which only 1,000 miles are paved. Many of the dirt and gravel roads routes are school bus routes. These roads are among the most underdeveloped, unsafe, and poorly maintained road networks in the country. This committee can authorize more funds to pave them. In my written testimony, I discussed the Appalachian region and the vision of, of the 89th Congress that had, they had in 1965 to see that targeted federal appropriations were made to a region and peoples that have not shared properly in the nation's prosperity. <clears throat> Thanks to the American people, the region prospers today. I ask this subcommittee to do the same for Indian country in the next highway bill. The modern day bipartisan federal policy of tribal self-governance authorized the transfer from federal agencies to tribes of today, day-to-day -day administration of federal programs and funds for tribes in the most efficient and streamlined manner, reducing burdensome regulations and minimizing transactional costs so that federal funds are expended at the local tribal level. Today, 95% of tribes carry out federal transportation and road maintenance programs. 
In closing, I ask this subcommittee to empower tribal government in the next out reauthorization measure by giving tribes the resources they need, primarily through the Tribal Transportation Program, the Tribal Transit Program, and through set-aside grants. Thank you for giving tribes a platform today to share our needs and goals with the subcommittee to reauthorization. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Councilman Garcia. Uh, we'll hear next from uh, Mary Beth Clark, president of the Intertribal Transportation Association. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Norton and Ranking Member Davis and the members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today concerning tribal transportation needs. My name is Mary Beth Clark, and I'm an enrolled tribal member of the Nez Perce tribe on my father's side and Klamath on my mother's. For the last 12 years, I have been the transportation manager for the Nez Perce tribe. I serve on the Department of Negotiated Rulemaking Committee and a regulatory body that <coughs> provides input to FHWA and BIA concerning the tribal transportation program. I have worked in Indian Affairs for over 25 years. I testify today as the president of the Intertribal Transportation Association, which is called ITA, a nonprofit, tri nonprofit tribal advocacy association which represents the transportation interests of tribes. There are a great unmet transportation infrastructure needs in Indian Country. ITA urges the subcommittee in your reauthorization bill to support and build on the Senate Bill S 2302, the tri tribal provisions, some of which include ITA recommendations. Tribes thank the committee for e elevating tribal transportation needs to the department, at the Department of Transportation by including us as a witness today. Infrastructure is the greatest catalyst to accelerate economic development and growth, especially in rural America where the most tribes members live and where transportation infrastructure lags behind the rest of the nation. It is important that Congress hear and respond favorably to tribal voices as you develop the reauthorization measure. The level of federal appropriations today often spells the difference between the success or failure of the tri tribal transportation programs. Unfortunately, American Indians and Native Alaska Natives are dying in preventable motor vehicle crashes well above the national level due in part of poor conditions of our road and the lack of safety features and behavioral issues. Roads and bridges in Indian Country today are known for their poor maintenance. A majority of these unimproved dirt and gravel roads, great distance to trauma centers, emergency response, and poor signage. But off, too often, federal appropriations are insufficient to the needs of tribes. Unmet deferred highway reconstruction and road maintenance needs in Indian Country are, different, are difficult to qualify because there are BIA-owned roads and bridges, tribally-owned roads and bridges, state and county, townships, and routes. But tribes can assure you the, um, the numbers are in the billions in these unmet needs harm Indian country and Indian people in undetermined economic growth. <clears throat> the National Highway Safety Administration captures foreign aspects of safe, successful traffic safety and expressions of the four E's, which is engineering, enforcement and regulations, education and information, and emergency response. I discussed the, old, the golden hour in the written testimony, testimony I provided. If a victim of a motor vehicle crash can reach a trauma center within 60 minutes to receive medical care, there, there is a likelihood that they will survive and not die from their injuries. Unfortunately, there is seldom that golden hour in Indian country. I close by highlighting a few of ITA's recommendations significantly increase the authorization funding level for the tribal transportation program each year. Restore the high priority project program funded with highway trust funds. Restore the exemption that once existed in Indian reservation roads but are, is now called TTP 
from the obligation limitation deduction. Direct the Department of Transportation to establish the Office of Self-Governance and create the Self-Governance Advisory Committee. Take into account the fact that tribes use federal transportation program funds to help with their road maintenance when setting your funding levels and significantly increase the authorization level for Federal Transit Administration, FTA, tribal transit programs, lower the dollar threshold in tribes and competitive grants, and raise the federal share to 100%. I take, thank you for this opportunity to testify, and it's been an honor, thank you. And we thank you, uh, Ms. Clark. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sergio uh, Picori uh, of the Hanson Professional Services. Good morning, Chair Norton, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to testify before you today. It's a real honor and privilege to be here. I'm the CEO of Hanson Professional Services, an engineering and design firm headquartered in Springfield, Illinois, with more than 500 employees and 28 offices across the country. We provide engineering, planning, and other professional consulting services for federal, state, and local governments, including federal land management agencies and tribes that are the focus of today's hearing. I want to make three main points to you today. Number one, tribes, federal lands, territories face tremendous infrastructure investment needs. Two, increased funding must be accompanied by more efficient management and decision making. And three, private sector firms play an essential role as trusted advisors and partnering with public agencies to deliver their projects. First, there is no question of the significant backlog of deferred maintenance and other transportation needs facing tribes, federal land management agencies, and territories. The other members of this panel have articulated those needs in much more detail. These funding shortfalls hinder the safety, mobility, and economic development opportunities for those communities. For these reasons, I agree that federal lands and tribal transportation programs should receive additional annual funding in any infrastructure package or surface transportation reauthorization bill that this committee puts together. However, funding alone is not sufficient. In my professional experience, it's clear that the agencies responsible for administering these programs need to improve their decision-making processes in coordination with the federal spectrum with the state and local officials to ensure that these funds are spent efficiently as possible. Let me highlight one project in particular that exemplifies these issues. The city of Springfield, Illinois, has initiated a six-mile, $315 million rail relocation and consolidation project. When finished, it will reduce congestion and delays, improve emergency vehicle access, and enhance vehicle and pedestrian safety. Hansen is the lead on this project. In the fall of 2014, shortly after construction, archaeologists discovered the foundations of seven homes and other historic artifacts in the right-of-way corridor. Further investigation revealed that these foundations were homes that were burned during the Springfield race riots in 1908. The outcry from this terrible event was the catalyst that led to the formation of the NAACP that year. Given the historic significance, the National Park Service has begun the process of designating the site as a historic monument. When it's complete, it will be an incredible memorial to those events and their aftermath. However, the federal agency processes have led to four years of project delays. Despite widespread community engagement and local stakeholder agreement on most of the appropriate path forward. There's much more detail in my written statement. I'd be happy to answer questions about this project and its implement, impl implications for project management and federal regulatory reviews. Lastly, I want to reiterate for the subcommittee the important role that firms like Hansen and our colleagues in the engineering industry play in helping our clients deliver projects in innovative and cost-effective ways. We are trusted advisors that bring specialized expertise, professional experience, and technological skills that saves time and money. 
As you develop your surface transportation reauthorization bill, I encourage you to advance policies that reflect and promote that partnership. Specifically, please reject any provisions that would interfere with the ability of the federal, state, or local agencies to partner with us for professional services that they require. Rather, Congress should promote contracting practices that ensure that qualified firms can compete for work and that incentivizes innovation and efficiency. I'll highlight one contract payment method that is currently authorized but underutilized. Lump sum, or sometimes referred to as firm fixed price, this negotiated payment increases the engineer's flexibility to manage a project and incentivizes innovation and creativity. It benefits public agencies by placing all cost inflation risk on the firm and streamlining the invoice and auditing process. There are no statutory barriers to lump sum, but we'd like to see it encouraged on federally funded projects, including those programs we're discussing today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pecori, for your testimony. We will move on to member questions now. Uh, I will begin with my own questions. Each member will have five minutes. Mr. Reef, could you clarify um, which portion of that huge number you gave us, 17.3 billion in deferred maintenance, which, which, what, what portion of that is National Park Service, uh, both their backlog and the, and the transportation? Uh, I don't have those specific Actually, numbers. Actually, that, that, if you don't have that break, breakdown and it wasn't in your testimony, would you get that breakdown? I will absolutely provide it for the record. Within the next week. Um, um, Mr. Reef, the uh, National Park Service includes important tourist destinations. Uh, of course, the uh, nation's capital I represent is one of them. And it affects local transportation as well. The Arlington Memorial Bridge in my district is being <laughs> rebuilt. I've been under that bridge to see what happens when you defer maintenance and how much more it costs us. Uh, the, true par the Pew Charitable Trust uh, says that the District of Columbia has over 500 million in deferred maintenance for transportation projects. I mean, you got that big number like that. I'm most interested in how the Park Service prioritizes investments among equally compelling transportation needs, and, and I mean geographically across the nation, when you have such a tremendous deficit. I mean, you just throw darts against a board uh, when all of it's in need, or how do, you, what, how do you decide what the priorities are? Mr. Reeve. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, the, the Department of the Interior, for, for all of our uh, um, construction investments, has a uh, fairly, a long established, fairly complex uh, process of ranking projects, including our transportation projects. Uh, the, the process includes, uh, it includes factors of asset condition, mitigation of health and safety risks, cost benefit analysis for each project, uh, consequences of failure to, delay, uh, failure to complete the work, uh, and the mission criticality of, of, of the asset. Um, for, for Transportation projects, there's additional um, requirements uh, to align with our long-range transportation plans that we've developed, as well as the statutory requirements in Title 23 that the project should, uh, um, <clears throat> pardon me, should inform um, our, that there, there are statutory um, uh, measures to reduce the uh, reduce the bridge deficiencies, incre improve the state of good repair, and reduce the uh, Improvement, improvements to safety needs. So we, we rank all the projects at the regional level through all of those lenses to determine the, the prior project needs. Uh, formidable task, uh, I must say. Um, uh, Mr. Petty, I was interested, uh, because this may provide some guidance for how we proceed with our new transportation infrastructure bill. Uh, the terrible hurricanes, uh, Hurricane uh, category five hurricanes repeatedly that yes. you had in, in Virgin Islands. And you, now you're saying that all local roads should meet federal standards um, and not just 
and not just uh, federal roads. Um, and you stress that, um, so, and you indicate something we need to understand as well, that the roads that were built to federal standards withstood these terrible hurricanes you've gone through. Um, is there a cost uh, to th this? What percentage of your roads were federal and what percentage were local? Uh, is there a cost that the Virgin Islands has taken into effect? Uh, are, uh, were you using resilient materials on the federal roads? That's something we are looking at for the next uh, bill. It's just that they were federal roads and they were just better. Uh, I'd appreciate your guidance on that. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, Chair Norton. Uh, the big key with the federal roads is that uh, the standards are definitely higher or were higher. And drainage, um, all the, the critical sub-base work that has to be done on a road to make sure that it lasts, those are all components of those federal roads. The local roads, many were built many years ago, never have even uh, had the opportunity to get reconstructed in a way that would make it more uh, resilient. So that's why I made that promulgation, to ensure that when we do rebuild with the FEMA dollars, it's not just a surface treatment that a few years later or less, we'll be back again after the next storm passes. So um, I think that's, that's a critical thing. Um, we are still uh, negotiating with FEMA for a final do dollar figure uh, because much of that work requires that sub-base work and that drainage improvements. Um, so once that number is finalized, I can give you a better indication of the separation of costs. Well, we certainly would appreciate because you understand that, that added cost, and you obviously calculated that it will so save you money in the long run, and you have local, federal, so you have something to compare side by side with. So thank you very much for that guidance. Uh, Ranking Member Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all the witnesses. Uh, Commissioner Petty, I, I do want to uh, thank you for sending uh, my good friend Stacy Plaskett here to be your delegate. Uh, she's one of the best, so welcome. Thank you. I, I wish I had a question for you, but <laughs> I, I didn't ask her permission first. So <laughs> next time I'll, I'll, I'll get that. All right. Hey, um, I, I want to speak with you, Mr. Picori. Thank you uh, for your work on the Springfield Rail Project that you and I have been working on together for years. Uh, it's a uh, it's a project in persistence, and a project that really shows the impact of what we do here in the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee when it comes to funding, when it comes to the issues that, uh, you know, the bipartisan issues of transportation and infrastructure that we face here in this in this committee. Um, give me your perspective on the significance of the potential race riot site that we saw the wonderful video on, uh, and, you know, why it's important for us to address a backlog of projects so that we can look ahead at newer projects like this. And if you could talk a little bit about the proximity to other historic sites that uh, this proposed site uh, is located in? Well, the, um, <clears throat> it was interesting when we first started working on this project, we knew that there could be the possibility of finding uh, the uh, race riot site or something left of, uh, of the homes there. Uh, and it happened to be on the right of way of the proposed uh, rail corridor. Uh, when it was uncovered, the significance became uh, a reality. And the significance to Springfield is, uh, is uh, something that's going to be hard to measure right away. Um, the, the proximity of the uh, race riot site is just a few blocks away from the National Park Service Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's home in the area uh, encompassing that. So the significance would be uh, tremendous linkage it would bring it would bring uh, real reality to Springfield of uh, the horrors that it suffered back in 1908, and it's bringing back a reality so we can teach our children uh, not only in the Springfield area in the state but nationally uh, something that should never happen again. Yeah, so the linkage is very important. The linkage is, and and just a few short blocks away too is the state of Illinois run Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum and Library. That's cool. uh, I think this is a unique opportunity when we look at how there's interagency communication since the Department of Interior runs the Park Service. Um, 
you know, the transportation dollars uncovered the, the artifacts, uh, we have a unique opportunity if we can get through this backlog. Uh, if I could when, mention one more thing, Congressman. The, uh, the funding for that project uh, that initiated that very first segment was uh, Tiger Grant. So that was uh, right through, uh, right through your, the subcommittee here and the committee in general. Absolutely. You've, you've been awarded on that rail project other transportation funding too, right? That's correct. A build grant? Pardon me? Build, the build right. program? Uh, two uh, Tiger grants, so one build grant. Absolutely. Uh, persistence pays off uh, when it comes to rail relocation. When did, do you remember what year you uncovered the artifacts during that, that Carpenter Street underpass project? Uh, it was 2014. So it was 2014. And the process you had to follow once those artifacts were uncovered, you immediately notified uh, Historic Preservation and other agencies. Give me a little idea of how that interagency cooperation worked and possibly how long it took to come up with a solution, especially uh, one to maybe display the artifacts at the Library of Congress, per se, or maybe eventually at the Smithsonian Museum of African American History. That's correct. What, what occurred initially was um, um, a decision on who was going to look at the artifacts, how is it going to be excavated, what, if it's going to be excavated, is it going to be covered over. There was uh, quite a discussion on, on what, what was the next step. Uh, the next step actually uh, was from the FRA, who decided that they would take a look at this and, and proceed with it. Uh, it, took, um, it took about three years uh, since it was uncovered until we were able to actually uh, excavate the uh, archaeological site and bring up, uh, bring up artifacts that were, again, uh, displayed uh, uh, with you, Congressman, and uh, Dr. Carla Hayden from the, uh, from the Library of Congress uh, and her interest in possibly showing them at the, uh, displaying them at the Library of Congress. So that was an integral part. Um, it took, it took uh, three meetings over three uh, years to finalize the conclusion of what would be done. So the archaeological excavation was completed at the end of last year, and now a report will be, uh, will be prepared on what was found and also where the, uh, where the artifacts are going to be displayed. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for your work. My time has expired. I thank the ranking member, Chairman DeFazio. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilman Garcia and or uh, Ms. Clark, uh, you both have referenced uh, the idea that we should have, now that we have uh, tribal uh, you know, self-governance on uh, transportation projects, but you now feel that there is a necessity to have uh, an office to, in DOT to oversee or coordinate that. Could you just tell me what, what the rationale is there? Am I loud enough? Okay. Thank you, Chairman DeFazio, for the question. Um, we are in deliberations, or we were in deliberations, on, on the self-governance initiative for Department of Transportation. And the establishing a self-governance office, we think, in any country, is an important uh, part of the self-governance initiative for the department as well as for the tribes. And to give you an example, the, uh, the two other self-governance initiatives through the BIA has a self-governance office. The Indian Health Service for self-governance has a... Uh, self-governance office. And so, because of the amount of work that's necessary to ensure that the uh, initiatives of self-governance are provided uh, ad adequately and things are run smoothly, you need more resources dedicated to implementing the self-governance initiative. And the most important piece uh, chairman, is the fact that when the rules are published finally in June, and we, we are uh, very positive that that's going to happen in June, and begins to get implemented, at that time, out of the 334 or so tribes that are self-governance with BIA and or IHS or IHS, uh, I think greater than 50% of those are going to want to 
enact the opportunity for self-governance on transportation. And so we want to be sure that the Department of Transportation is ready to move forward with implementing the act of self-governance for the Department of Transportation. But that's just for the beginning part of it. And so now we got to worry about, okay, now it's moving. So mm -hmm. here we go. We got we to gotta keep going with the rest of the tribes that may want to pursue this option. And so the resources are going to be almost endless in terms of the, the need to provide support for the tribes, but as well provide an opportunity for the tribes to identify if there are any refinements need to be made in terms of operations from the tribal level and in partnership with the department that needs to be monitored continuously and a self-governance office would allow that to happen. Um, and so right now we're hoping that the Department of Transportation will in time, short time, enact that the uh, uh, self-governance office will be put in place. And so it will be a positive thing for both the government, uh, United States government, Department of Transportation, as well as for all of the tribes across the land. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Clark, did you want to add anything to that? No. Oh, yep. I believe he covered that. Okay, great. Uh, Deputy Chief French, uh, you know, Forest Service maintenance backlog, 5.2 billion, 3.6 billion attributed to transportation alone. Uh, and you got a very generous 85 million out of the federal lands transportation program over the life of the FAST Act. Uh, has, uh, during the FAST Act, has your maintenance backlog grown on transportation issues? It absolutely has. Um, you know, if you look at the, the overall needs we have, uh, the FAST Act is, is helping address maybe 3%, right. and the growing backlog we have is outpacing that um, greatly. And some of it, at least I know in my region, relates to uh, critical environmental issues where you have, uh, you know, culverts that have collapsed or are otherwise, uh, you know, causing problems, erosion, and and uh, and that. Uh, what 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 are the principal needs that you would point to? Well, I, and I, you know, I, I know you're an avid user of our national forests, and you've probably seen many of these. I said, I would say the biggest things we have right now is uh, really uh, crumbling infrastructure around our bridges, our aquatic passages, as you know, uh, mentioned. But the other part is just the basic road maintenance, simple basic road maintenance. And as we feel the growth of uh, catastrophic fire happening, especially in the West, our ability to use roads. Um, access those areas has the importance seems to be growing at the same rate as we're seeing some of the risk of fire. And our ability to actually go in and keep those roads open and well maintained so the roads aren't having environmental effects, that's one of our biggest needs right now. Okay, so environment, disasters, fires, and obviously recreation. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairman DeFazio. Mr. LaMalfa. Thank you and welcome panelists. Uh, appreciate your uh, time and attention here. Um, I'm, I want to zero in on uh, forest uh, service roads especially too. I have uh, Northern California where we've had our plenty share of fire as well. And uh, so we're looking at uh, a situation where we have about 150 million dead trees in California. As, as you're aware, and um, in order to catch up with a backlog of trees that aren't dead, we probably need, need to take the 150 and plus 300 million more. So access to these lands is gonna be extremely important. And so looking at the comparison here of uh, funding for Forest Service roads versus uh, National Park roads, um, I'm seeing that, um, uh, you know, as uh, Mr. French, uh, you mentioned that, uh, I think Mr. DeFazio mentioned the number, 85 million over uh, a five-year period, was it? So about 19 million a year, 17 million. So that in comparison to, um, I, I think uh, national parks are receiving a much bigger number. I think uh, 330 million is what's proposed or in, in an upcoming year. So. 
the disparity there, especially in that there's four times as many road, miles of public road in the parks as there is in, excuse me, in the forest as there's national parks is the way I have it. So we got a problem here and a disparity. And I know Mr. Carbajal and I are working on legislation to try and plus that up and even that up. So I appreciate being able to work with him on that. And, um, tell me, Mr. French, um, well, you like the movie De the, the Departed? I do. Okay, good. I'll just leave that there. So, um, <clears throat> the uh, issue with the disparity here and how far behind we are on on forest management, anyway, and the other uses we're talking about for access and all the you know emergency personnel. Um, what what do you? Just how far behind do you think we are, and what, what could we be doing to advance the, our work around here for vegetation management besides, you know, trying to catch up on funding? What are the roadblocks you're seeing? Thank you for the question. You know, if you look over the last four years, and, and specific to your question, yes, we've received about 85 million. You compare that as you did to the Park Service, there, that's around 1.42 billion. So there is a big difference in, in the way that we've looked at the funding. And I think that um, there, is, there is a need to look at the, the overall needs and the relative amounts to see if there's, a, if there's a more rational way to look at those. I also think that the efficiency that's been mentioned earlier about um, the way the funds are applied, um, that could be increased in terms Need of flexibility on that. Excuse me? Flexibility, perhaps? Flexibility, but also, I, you know, honestly, probably more direct appropriation to the agencies rather than the, the period that we go through to receive those. That would bring funding uh, locally more quickly to address issues, uh, especially in terms of um, disasters and things like that. Um, I think the other big thing that's occurring right now for us is that as we're driving what limited dollars we have towards really focusing on addressing the increasing fuels and fire issue we have, um, it's actually putting less funds available for access to recreation sites um, and maintaining that. But I would say that connectivity of roads that these rural communities depend upon. Are you having to rob Peter to pay Paul just to keep up with that a little bit? And, is that, and that takes away from some of the management we're talking about, right? With it does. And, 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 and roads dollars is one of the biggest factors that limits our ability to do active forest management. You can't go in and thin forest to reduce fire if you can't get the equipment over the bridges to get there. Right, right, okay. Uh, Mr. Reif, um, do, you, do you see a disparity here too? I mean, I, I don't, you probably don't wanna knock your own budget here, but do you see in partnership where you have uh, you know, contiguous issues with the Forest Service and parks? How, how do you guys come out so well <laughs> on funding? Well, I, I, thank you for the question. I, I would say that I, I recognize your, your point about the Park Service. It is substantially bigger than the Forest Service. Some of our other bureaus are much closer in line with the, the funding levels that, that the Forest Service receives, such as the Bureau of Land Management uh, receives approximately six to eight million dollars per year. Bureau of Reclamation is in, in that range somewhere as well. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service is, is about 30 million dollars per year. Uh, so. I, I understand your, your question. It, it does appear to be a significant uh, difference in, in funding levels. I, I will say that the maintenance backlogs are, are equally as significant. Uh, Maybe borrow their lobbyists a little bit, Mr. French, on that and when you're getting the funding there. So I'd, uh, I'd love to t come to the tribes here, but the five minutes has already flown by. So are you back, Madam Chair? Thank you. Uh, we'll hear next from uh, from uh, Mr. Huffman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank uh, the witnesses for a very important conversation. Uh, serving as both a member of the Transportation Committee and the Natural Resources Committee, I see firsthand the importance of fully funding our federal land management agencies and their transportation needs. We hear a lot about the maintenance backlog, backlog facing our public lands, uh, facilities, campgrounds, water systems, and a lot more than that um, contribute to this deferred maintenance. But we can't forget that almost half the backlog is transportation infrastructure, paved roads and bridges, and that's why this committee's work is so critical for our public lands. Mr. Reef, I, I would like to start with you 
In your testimony, you outlined the importance of Interior's surface transportation network for uh, visitors and users of our public lands, including the role of drawing tourists to different sites, fostering local economic growth for small businesses in nearby communities. Um, that's a very important point. And uh, I think it's important to remember that our public lands don't exist in isolation. Uh, they exist alongside gateway communities uh, that depend on them for their local economy. And that's why we have this federal lands access program, or FLAP, uh, which is critically important to districts like mine. My district starts at the Oregon border, goes to the Golden Gate Bridge, and so you can imagine all of the great public lands that I am honored to represent, from Redwood National Park to Muir Woods National Monument, Point Reyes National Seashore, just to name a few. Uh, but this uh, richness of public lands can also create some challenges, uh, such as the importance of planning for <coughs> wildlife crossings, in rural areas to avoid unnecessary collisions, addressing, in some cases, too much traffic from visitation, like the problems we had at Muir Woods, and uh, the negative impact to the local community from that congestion, and also ensuring that partnerships between federal agencies and local communities uh, are functional. So one of my concerns is we're not doing enough to ensure that all agencies involved in FLAP are on the same page. I think we need to include uh, FHWA as a partner alongside public land agencies like the National Park Service in working with local communities. And this is especially true in places like California where we see labor shortages and the challenge of working in remote locations. This can conflict with narrow, overly prescriptive designs that might uh, percolate up within federal agencies. So uh, an example, I have portions of my district uh, leading out into the Point Reyes National Seashore where we have frequent seasonal flooding, ongoing erosion, uh, poor pavement, and more. And we have seen a bidding and contracting process that is moving at a glacial pace and is way over budget. You know, one simple road repair job looks like it's gonna consume a budget that we need to spread among a whole bunch of different priorities in that part of my district. So Mr. Reef, as we look at the next surface transportation bill, what level of funding do you think is required for our land management agencies to keep current assets in good working condition and to prevent a growing deferred maintenance backlog? Sure, thank you for the question, sir. Uh, we have done a variety of analysis um, from pavement, pavement condition analysis, pavement condition modeling, um, cost, cost benefit analysis, and um, uh, long, long range um, pavement condition surveys. And our, our analysis is that the department as a whole um, could, could benefit from $1.1 billion, our, our needs as a whole are $1.1 billion in, uh, to, to return our, our roads and, and bridges and transportation systems to a good condition, keep it at a good condition, modernize the network, and provide for multimodal transportation systems. I appreciate you pegging that number uh, as, as the real need, because right now I understand that we are uh, appropriating only about $300 million annually, so uh, we are far behind uh, catching up to that need, and I appreciate you uh, putting a fine point on it. Uh, in my remaining time, I want to highlight the importance of safe bicycling and walking paths. Uh, currently, our federal lands transportation program does not ensure that any minimum amount of funding goes to active transportation, such as walking or cycling. I have a bill, the Active Transportation for Public Lands Act, which would create a minimum 5% for our federal lands transportation program funds for walking and biking trails and infrastructure associated with active transportation. Now, this is part of my work with several colleagues on this committee, including Congressman Pappas and Congressman Lipinski. Um, and we're trying to ensure that building act active transportation networks uh, support healthy, vibrant communities. As we work on this surface transportation bill, I hope we'll not only invest in active transportation, but remember the importance of doing that on our public lands as well. And Madam Chair, I thank you for the time and yield back. Mr. Ho Mr. Hoffman, I certainly hope I'm an original co-sponsor of that bill. We want to stress alternative modes of transportation in our next bill. Nothing could be more, I mean, scooters, <laughs> you name it. But certainly walking uh, this very walkable city, so I appreciate uh, what you've just said. Um, 
Mr. Uh, Stauber, thank you for yielding your time to the ranking member, as I understand it. Thank you, Mr. Stauber, for that time, and thank you for yielding it to me. You're, you're welcome, uh, ranking member. I yield members. it back to you, sir. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the text, too. There's some kind of trick here, but <laughs> I go along with these Republican tricks. <laughs> thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairwoman Graves and ranking, uh, Chairwoman Norton, ranking member Graves. Uh, Mr. French, it's great to see you again today. And uh, I have got a couple of comments uh, to state here, then some questions at the end. Um, I want to speak a little bit about the Tribal Transportation Program formula funding that took place in MAP 21 and, and the FAST Act. Uh, rural Minnesota tribes have expressed a compelling need for highway infrastructure funding to develop, improve, and maintain the inadequate road systems on Indian reservations in the state of Minnesota. Minnesota tribal leaders are also telling me their annual funding was drastically cut over the past decade at the same time funding to tribes in some other states was increased. A decade ago, tribal funding was distributed among tribes through a needs-based formula that the tribes themselves had negotiated in a tribal federal negotiation rulemaking process in the early 2000s. However, MAP 21 and FAST Act replaced this formula with a congressionally written formula that more heavily weighs population members over road acreage, actual road conditions, and transportation needs. Under the MAP 21 and FAST Act formulas, Minnesota tribes, like the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians, whose reservation consists of more than 840,000 acres and 561 miles of roads, have lost more than $10.5 million in funding since the change changes have been implemented. I'll just ask both of you, what is being done to track the impact that the change in the funding formula has had on tribal governments throughout all of Indian country, region by region, and state by state? Mr. French. Thank you, Representative. Actually, the specifics of that question, I would defer to my colleague here from Department of Interior. Mr. Ray. Thank, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I'd be honest, I'm not sure I, I know what has been at, at that level, it's, it's, that would be a, a bureau-specific issue, and, and I'm, I'm not aware of what tracking they're, they're doing, but we can absolutely provide that for the record. And that's what I'll ask. Um, would you please provide uh, the specific data uh, to this committee uh, when you get it? Uh, because we have to know the, 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 the amount that was taken away from certain um, uh, tribes and given to others because of the formula change. And I think it's important that we recognize that, that uh, there was a, a diminished funding to certain tribes. Um, and then what has the federal agency done to address the inequities that have been result, that have resulted from MAP 21 and FAST Act funding in Minnesota and throughout Indian country? So we know there's been a reduction in some areas, an in, increase in others. What are you doing, what do you have plans for to help reinvest in those areas that uh, lost their funding due to a formula change? Thank you for the question. I, 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 uh, my I, I, I don't know what we've been doing to, to mitigate for changes in, in statute. Mr. French? Yeah, it, it, thank you, Representative. We actually don't have oversight in, in our agency of that, so that, again, that's why I refer that to the Department of Interior. Thank you. Mr. Garcia. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, first of all, um, I think it's important to realize that the funding formula, transportation funding formula, has changed over the course of the years. And it may be time to revisit the funding formula because I don't know that the tribes at that time, in the past few times, have been as active and as, um, you might say, have been allowed to take part in the uh, developing the funding formula. But some of the parameters and some of the variables used in the current funding formula may have changed. And so it may be time to revisit the formula, but if that were to happen, what we would suggest is that Indian country also be a part of the group that begins to look at um, first assessing the formula, and then uh, if there is to be developed another formula, and I'll give you one example that if the funding formula is put in place, the bigger tribes, the large land-based tribes, are going to uh, fare differently than Okeowinge. We have 12,000 acres of land, uh, and so right off the bat, if there's population or if the, uh, the uh, land base and the number of road miles 
is a factor, and it is, uh, the smaller tribes, the smaller land-based tribes do not fare as well. So there's a discrepancy in that part of it. But the other things that have, may have changed are the, um, um, the what would you say, the, the life changes in this country. One might think about, uh, an example might be, right now we're, we're using gas tax as a means to bring revenue for Department of Transportation. So as time goes on, we may not have as much gas using vehicles. We'll, we'll be turning to electric vehicles. So the funding uh, amount revenue stream will tend to go down. But as, as we speak, the funding that's available for self-governance under the uh, FAST Act started out at $465 million mm -hmm. for all tribes, and it's up to, I believe, $505 million, uh, this year, 2020. And I, and I think, Mr. Garcia, my time's out, but you, you made a, a real uh, a good point. We have to factor in the road miles, the average daily traffic, and the, and the pavement quality index in part of that, and so I appreciate it, and my time is out. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stauber, Ms. Bronley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. French, um, Los Padres National, Far uh, National Forest is in, in my district. Uh, in 2017, we had the Thomas Fire, which um, at the time in 2017 was the largest wildfire in California's history. Um, I'm just wondering, um, and, and Los Padres was was very much impacted by that fire. Are you aware of any instances at, uh, at Los Padres National Forest where um, firefighter operations couldn't get to where they needed to get due to the roads and access? Thank you uh, for the question. I mean, you have one of the largest deferred maintenance backlogs that we have. It's like $510 million in, in your area. I don't, I can't give you some recent experience, I mean, uh, specifics. We could follow up that, but I will share with you more than 20 years ago, when I was a firefighter, I was on the Los Padres, and uh, we were hot spotting, trying to get to areas. And yes, we very much ran into that issue where roads that were closed, even for administrative uses, we could not get into to access. And as you know, in the Los Padres, those fires are fast. And the quicker that you can get there, the better. But I can certainly look into getting you more recent examples than my own experience. And in just in terms of roads, my understanding, uh, you just mentioned the large backlog, but my understanding with roads, it's, six, it's about $17 million of deferred, uh, of deferred maintenance for, for roads. Um, if that's true, I'm just, uh, I'm, if you could get, get me the information to just uh, share with my office a list of the projects as well as expected completion dates uh, based on current funding levels. If you have that, um, I would appreciate getting it. Yeah, we've got it throughout the state of California and we can break it down into the specifics of roads in, in California and by district. Absolutely. Very, very good. Um, Mr. Garcia, first I want to thank you for your service to our nation. Um, thank you for that. I noticed your Air Force uh, hat, so I want to thank you for your service. Um, I recently was in South Dakota and visited um, uh, uh, two tribes, uh, the Cheyenne River and Standing Rock Sioux, um, two of the poorest uh, tribes. I was really there to look at uh, VA and IHS healthcare services to our, to our veterans and access to that. But what was abundantly clear to me on the trip was seeing the conditions um, of the roads, uh, of the roads there. And uh, those conditions are impacting our veterans getting to their appointments. Obviously there are weather conditions um, the uh, land mass uh, is, is huge, um, but the horrible roads are, are really impacting uh, uh, veterans to, to receive their health care. Um, and um, I'm, I'm just wondering, I, I know in uh, one of the testimonies, uh, it was stated that um, uh, 
uh, tribes are not required to report their uh, data uh, to the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation on the condition and performance of, of tribal roads, um, making it uh, difficult to assess the overall conditions of, of roads nationally. Do you believe if we did collect that data, um, uh, do you think we should be required to collect that data, and do you think that that's what would uh, help uh, in any way making the case? First point, I think it's important to understand that uh, data is an important means, and when we talked about the funding formula, if uh, you have the wrong data or you have in invalidated data or inadequate data, you're liable to provide wrong information that then impacts the amount of dollars that flows through the system. Well, when you're talking about transportation data, uh, that could also be data such as law enforcement data for highway safety, accidents, and uh, fatalities, and all of that. Uh, if, if you're on tribal land, you end up having to deal with at least three databases, the tribal database, the law enforcement database, <laughs> the state and county and state highway database, and then the federal database. And in this case, the federal database, depending on who you report the data to, uh, sometimes BIA, sometimes uh, other places, um, the, the data is not consistent. And the form of the data is not consistent. The databases is not, uh, are not consistent. The collection of the data are not consistent. So if you look at the discrepancies in those systems, uh, you're not looking at very accurate data. And so I think it's an important piece of the puzzle uh, to be resolved, and parts of that can be done by providing funding for uh, developing the data systems that the BIA uses, um, that the tribes use. That could be a consistent one, and if we do it together, the more likely that it's going to suffice and work for both entities. And the same with when we include the state, then it's important that they also be involved in the development of whatever data we have. Thank we you, Mr. Mr. Garcia. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Palmer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ms. Clark, what portion of overall transportation funding comes from the FAST Act programs? Pardon? <coughs> What, did they what portion of overall transportation funding comes from FAST Act programs? What portion of the funding? Yeah. Well, you mean the allocations of FAST Act? Which of is your overall funding? How much of that is from FAST Act grants or, or appropriations? The, well, in 2019, it was $495 million, and this year it's $505 million. What's your total uh, expenditure for your transportation programs then? What's your total outlay? The How total much do you spend annually on your transportation programs? It's more than 505 bi uh, million, isn't it? Correct. Do you know how much it is? Um, that's hard to determine because of the unmet needs or the uh, deferred yeah. maintenance. Yeah, but you know how much money you actually have to spend, don't you? On do you have a budget? Yes. How, how much do you budget? For my tribe personally? For, uh, for all tribes? For all tribes, do you know? Oh, for all tribes, well, after the obligation limitation, we only had a 449000 in our TTP funds. So okay, your okay, obligation let's... limitation takes most of it out. All right. Um, I'll submit the question in writing, and, and I think it'll be a little bit easier to answer. Okay. Uh, Mr. Garcia mentioned uh, uh, gasoline tax and, and, and I think accurately identified the fact that that is a declining source of revenue because of increased fuel efficiency and, and the conversion to electric uh, vehicles. Uh, what sources of revenue other than the Fast Act programs do you rely on and uh, other than the gas tax? Or do you have other sources of, of revenues?
Are you talking about one tribe or my tribe or other tribes? I'd like to know generally all tribes. And um, what I'm trying to find out is, are there other ways that we can provide funding? I'm, this actually, I'm, I'm hoping to make a point. Uh, so you're getting $505 million. Is it just your tribe, Ms. Clark, that gets the $505 million, or is that all tribes? That's all the, all the That's tribes. That's all the tribes. Okay. Correct. Yes, sir. And then, uh, and then you have other sources of funding, which Mr. Garcia, you identified as a gasoline tax, which you uh, accurately identified as a declining revenue source. Do you have other sources of, of revenue to fund your transportation programs? Well, I, I can answer that in a general way, and that is that uh, many of the tribe, in fact, all of the tribes that are uh, funded through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, mm -hmm. uh, through the Indian Health Service, uh, those funds are number one not adequate to meet the needs of the of the community and not, uh, the me, tribes. Yeah, it, transportation to... is in that same boat that the the tribe supplements the funding that is current funding that received federal funding that's received, okay. and so. That's the same thing that would happen with the Department of Transportation funding is that the funding that provided for, uh, I'll speak for Okeowinge, will not meet all of the needs in terms of transportation, all of the projects, the bridges, the uh, Okay, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying so to help you out here. So there will be revenues available uh, right. that we would have to supplement. And so, you know, the revenues are just like any government would have. Okay. What I'm trying to do is identify how much we provide through the FAST Act, what other sources of revenues that, that you have. And I think we've already pretty well nailed down the fact that, that all those revenue sources combined with what you're getting from the FAST Act are, in, are insufficient. You've got an enormous backlog. So my next question is, is uh, the, the, the tribes nationwide have resources, energy resources, natural gas, oil, and, and, and my question, uh, Mr. Garcia and, and Ms. Clark, is do the tribes, uh, first of all, do they allow the, um, uh, the sale of these resources? And if they do, do you get a portion of the revenues? Do you get all the revenues? Or, or is that even a, a revenue stream that could help support your, your infrastructure and transportation needs? I can, I can answer. Uh, most tribes receive field tax funding from from what they receive in their in their reservation, and that is spent well with the Nespers tribe. We spend it on whatever the state spends their field tax are on. Those, so, are those taxes and revenues from field tax uh, sales? N no, um, I'm talking about. Do you have oil and natural gas on on tribal lands that you that you should um, own as a sovereign nation, you should own that. Are you allowed to access that for oil and gas exploration, and are you allowed to take the revenues from that? Our tribe in Nespers country, we do not have any natural gas lines going through that area. However, other tribes, um, it is hard for them to get involved in trying to get a portion of those fundings. So, um, They've tried, they've worked at it, and so, yes, you're right. Most tribes don't receive those. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chairman. May I just, um, I'm trying to, to, to be helpful uh, with this, and I'm not sure that they fully understood, and I take responsibility for that, so I will submit some questions in writing. Um, but my intent here is to, to try to identify other funding sources that will help the tribes meet their needs, and I appreciate uh, your indulgence. I yield back. I, I appreciate receiving that. That's an important question in writing, and we will make sure it is submitted to the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, I want to thank you, the Chair, for holding this very important hearing, the first time in decades that we have really listened to those, the transportation needs on federal lands, on tribal lands, and U.S. territories. For me, I'm going to ask some questions, but the most important thing has just been listening and understanding, which we haven't had that opportunity to do before. And so 
I'd like that message to go out. Thank you for being here. Thank you for educating us. It's very important uh, because we frequently overlook this, but not because it's deliberate. It's just that we have so many other needs unless somebody takes the time and says, hey, let's look at this issue. So I very much appreciate this. Uh, I want to talk about, to Commissioner Petty, uh, I'm interested in both climate change and, the, and resiliency, how we deal with some of those issues, resilient infrastructure uh, in the territories. And so your testimony, Commissioner Petty, uh, underscores just how important resilient infrastructure is for vulnerable, disaster-prone areas such as the Virgin Islands. Uh, and we've seen the challenges that deficient infrastructure can pose in these areas in the wake of the recent hurricanes, especially in Puerto Rico. We've really seen that directly, where supplies stacked up in the port areas, not because of, of the ports, but because we didn't have the infrastructure to get those supplies, uh, and we didn't have the surface uh, inf infrastructure. So the question is, uh, are you concerned that the current federal funding levels for transportation prevent the territories from really constructing resilient infrastructure? Are we really, you know, we talk about infrastructure, but we, we know the impacts that you have and the vulnerabilities. Are we, are we building enough resilient, or are we funding enough for resilient infrastructure? Uh, currently, no, we're not. And, um, for us, we, we've been in this catch-up mode, uh, trying to do the things to sustain uh, some sort of infrastructure, and, and doing it the right way, so to speak, is difficult because you have to address the needs of the public right now. But to do it right, we definitely need the appropriate, appropriate funding to uh, build that type of resiliency. And, and maybe you could fill us in just to educate us a little bit on how climate change now is affecting how the Virgin Islands and other territories are planning for future transportation issues. You ha you're in a unique situation. Right. Uh, so, so maybe uh, you share that with us too. Yes, so definitely uh, all our projects, we, we definitely have to look at uh, sea level rise, uh, some of our major expansion projects in our harbors. We're building new roads uh, just for the, the increase in population and tourism activity. The storm surge is a real thing that uh, has impacted our infrastructure over many uh, of the last few, few storms that we've had. So um, when we build these roads, and uh, we have one section of roadway that we're building right now, it's probably a quarter mile, and it's costing us $42 million for just that stretch of road, um, primarily because of those type of resiliency type uh, features that have to go into these type of projects. Thank you. I want to change the subject a little bit to talk to Mr. Reef about the National Park Services, the backlog that you have on the national, but how it's the backlog and the impacts upon the local communities are really what I'm most interested in. You know, we know, you know, the monies that you spend and uh, we've heard, but right now we, I, I'm focusing on the importance of the National Parks or all of our parks uh, to local economies. Um, can you give us what the impacts, what, you know, to these economies are when our parks, our roads, our bridges, tunnels are not in good repair? What, how does that impact the local economies? Thank, thank you for the question, sir. Um, the 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 deferred maintenance backlog uh, do, does have a significant impact on our our local gateway communities to to the to all of our federal lands. The uh, Small, business, small businesses that, that rely on, on access to our federal lands, um, you know, outfitters, guides, um, uh, ranchers, um, all, all of the uh, uh, small businesses in the area r rely on being able to access their access their local federal lands. A number of those small businesses- It's you are the engine that drives the local economy. Absolutely, sir. The, the, if many many small businesses only have permits to operate in certain locations, and if they don't have, uh, if that access is not not available because the transportation infrastructure is too deteriorated, then they 
they don't have an opportunity to succeed. They can't move to the next location that maybe have better infrastructure. Um, it also Im uh, it impacts the, you know, the, it, with, even when it's in town, the local hotels, restaurants will have a much better opportunity to succeed if, if they have more patrons who are able to get into their, their neighboring federal resources. The gentleman's um, time has expired. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Woodall. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Yeah, I want to pick up where Mr. Lowenthal uh, left off. I saw in your testimony, uh, Mr. French, you were talking about the categorical exclusions that you all are, are moving towards using and how that's dealing with the backlog. And I want to give you a chance to expound on that if I have time. But, but Mr. Reef, let's go to, to, to uh, Interior because we do count on uh, uh, those parks, not just as an environmental engine for those local communities, but we count on you all to set the standard uh, for environmental uh, protection. And right? I don't even expect a project to show up on your list unless it's gone through your own rigorous uh, in-house uh, uh, process to, to say this is going to uh, be, this is going to fit with the environmental stewardship that America counts on us for. So I'm thinking about uh, after you all have gone through that process to propose uh, a project, uh, that you then have to go back on a water project for a 404 uh, approval, or if it's a large enough project that you're then going to have to go back and, and, and do a NEPA review, or if it uh, involves a historical projects, go back for a, for a 106 uh, uh, review. Uh, tell me about uh, that. Thinking about ways that we can find bipartisan uh, partnership, uh, we disagree on, on how many uh, reviews are the right number of reviews, but because you all do set a standard uh, for the protection of America's uh, resources, if we ought to be able to start anywhere uh, to consolidate those reviews, expedite those reviews, deal with the backlog that, that Mr. Lowenthal uh, talked about, I would expect it to be with you. Thank you for the question, sir. Uh, let me start by saying I'm not, I, I don't work on the environmental compliance end of the program. Uh, I, I mostly work on the infrastructure um, engineering side of the program, but my understanding is a lot of those reviews happen concurrently while they're working through the environmental process. And so what do we find that, that the Park Service is proposing a project and then we do a, a 106 uh, review and find out that that would have been destructive to historical resources and you all just didn't know that? ahead of time? Does the Park Service propose a project and then we go back and do a 404 uh, review concurrently and find out that, that uh, the project you proposed was going to be destructive to America's water resources? I, I just expect that a project never even makes it uh, past your drawing board unless it fits all of these standards that we expect uh, from, from one another and that we expect the Park Service to set a, set a standard on. So I, I'm, from an engineering perspective, do you find that, that you've proposed something and it's gone through an internal review and then all of these external reviews uh, come into place and, and you made a mistake uh, when you let it out of an internal uh, process? Thank you for the question. So my understanding and is that the when you, when you propose a project, you have a pretty good idea of what kind of hurdles you are, are going to Gonna, gonna, gonna see in those type of projects. Uh, and so you can work to help um, make sure that you avoid those ahead of time. You, you don't always succeed. There, there sometimes are endangered species um, that you weren't aware of or, or something along those lines. So it's not, not perfect. We're always looking at ways to improve our process and be more streamlined, but uh, Yes, sir. They, I, I hope we'll be able to come back to that, Madam Chair, is because uh, DOI is a trusted uh, uh, partner. We do all uh, have a, a reverence for our, our parks, and, and we, we, we can share a common ground on, on if we can streamline. Uh, if we have a trusted partner anywhere that would allow us to streamline it, it should be DOI. Mr. French, you have a tougher uh, job because uh, your uh, uh, lands actually work uh, for a living. Uh, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a different issue. But can you tell me a little bit about how some of those categorical exclusions have, have dealt with, uh, have the potential to deal with, with backlog and, and make a difference? You bet. Um, you know, as an agency, we've been in this space with uh, uh, declining resources, mainly because of the costs of fire suppression. And so we've been looking really hard about the way we do our work so we can drive as much of those, that funding we do have to the ground. Um, we've looked at it in a variety of ways, and that's one of them. So it, it, it can look at our contracting processes, our investment processes, how we decide what should be funded. But on the environmental review side, we looked at 
um, over the last five years, all the environmental reviews we had done on like type projects for uh, roads, let's say, environmental assessments. And from that, we took those actions that under the CEQ regs say are routine and um, not significant. And we proposed those into CEs, and that's based on our administrative record. That creates tremendous efficiencies. It can change the time frame of looking at one of these projects from two years down to six months. They, I don't think there's anyone on this panel that wants to dodge our stewardship uh, responsibility, but there's uh, stewardship of the environment uh, that can be paired with stewardship of dollars so that we can get more projects done uh, uh, for those communities that Mr. Lowenthal uh, uh, mentioned uh, makes a big difference. So I appreciate the, uh, your, uh, your leadership in that, uh, in that area. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Woodall. Uh, Mr. Carabell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Deputy Chief French, uh, first I want to thank you and uh, the Forest Service for the extraordinary work, especially in providing emergency response. I represent the Central Coast of California, which includes the Los Padres National Forest, and our forest traditionally has a demanding fire response, as you know. Uh, that's why I'm also uh, proud to have initiated the Forest Act, with, uh, which is a bipartisan uh, legislation, H.R. 5334, that will address the disparity in funding between the Forest Service and the National Park Service to address the backlog and to allow for the roads to be better maintained, perhaps even expanded, to do better fuels management and to provide better access to our first responders, our firefighters. Um, today I want to touch on that and also discuss some of the Forest Service needs. In your testimony, you discussed that the Forest Service transportation infrastructure has fallen behind in its ability to meet user needs. The figure you cite is about 3.6 billion deferred maintenance backlog. What are each of the different funding resources available to USFS for your transportation needs and how much of that comes out of the programs authorized by this committee? And two, with such a significant backlog, how has this impacted your agency's ability to do proper forest management or firefighting activities? Great. Thank you for the question, and, and thank you for your leadership and uh, Mr. Lamalfa's leadership on, on recognizing this issue. We, we certainly appreciate it. Um, so if you look at our overall funding that we have in the agency, we're getting about 19 million per year. Uh, that's our current. It's been 18 in the past and 17. Uh, directly through the, the FAST Act. Um, if you look at the, the funds that we receive through ERFO for um, uh, disaster related, um, that number can be up to 50 million, but it's, it's usually in response to maybe a landslide after a fire that's occurred in your, in your district. Um, appropriated dollars that are not part of this committee that go directly to our, our road and trails um, is about 220 million um, that we receive. And uh, that represents right now where it's, the, we find that the funding that we have right now represents about 3% of the need of the deferred maintenance we have. And, and our primary issue, as you started to point out, is that um, trying to address those roads to deal with the, the broader active management, the forest thinning issues that we have is a challenge. Now there's, one other, there's other sources we do get, and one of those is through timber sales. We can receive, um, we can put, as part of our timber sales, we can ask the purchasers to improve roads. The issue that we find ourselves in is that what we're doing these days is less about high value commercial timber. It's about protecting communities, thinning forests to reduce fire. Sometimes we have to pay to get those trees out of the woods. So we used to rely on timber sales to help fund many of these things. That's not there anymore because we don't receive the same receipts that we used to. The value is different. Thank you very much. And again, I really appreciate uh, the extraordinary work uh, your agency does in my district. Thank you so much. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Chairwoman Norton. And thank you all for being here today. As a representative, for a largely rural district, I know firsthand how important highway and road construction can be, and in particularly for 
connecting our constituents to essential needs and goods and services along with, along with bringing economic development to communities who desperately need it. As a member of this committee for the past year, I've learned so much about how many of our states and our districts are struggling to meet their infrastructure demands. I know in my district of West Virginia, which is very rural and very mountainous, that our bridges can remain incomplete, road work seems to be never ending, and our economy suffers from the consequences. The Highway Trust Fund remains woefully underfunded and it's essential for this committee to find a reasonable solution to our nation's infrastructure needs. Mr. French and Mr. Is it Reif or Reef? Reef, Mr. Reef. What problems do the U.S. Forest Service and the Department of Interior have with maintaining rural access roads? And how can Congress ensure that these rural areas continue to be serviced with quality roads? Thank you very much for the question. It is a, it's a huge challenge for us. I mean, the primary first piece is the overall funding that's available. Um, I, I, in West Virginia, on the Monaga-Gila National Forest, I think in your district, there's at least 17 million um, in deferred maintenance that we're working on right now. Um, we don't even come close to being able to have the resources to hit all those. So what we end up doing is stopgap measures. I, I mentioned in my testimony about a bridge in Pennsylvania that services a community that we can't get fire trucks across right now to protect those communities. We've had to put in a stopgap temporary fix just to allow that to happen. And, it, and that's the sort of triage that we find ourselves doing at any time. Um, I think that we think there could be a more rational approach to how the FAST Act is allocated. I think that we would be open, opening to discussing other ways that we could look at funding some of these critical needs. And I think that um, we very much stand up uh, to say we should be more efficient and effective in how we use those dollars and show you that and accountable. I think all those three things are very important in order to resolve this issue. Thank you. I, I would echo my colleagues' comments that uh, we are drastically underfunded with uh, trying to keep up with all of the deferred maintenance um, in, our, in our portfolio. Um, I, I reference in my testimony a study by the National Academy of Sciences that indicates that uh, two to four percent of an asset value should be contributed to maintenance um, for, for every year annually for maintenance, and we're able to, con to contribute about half a percent of, of, our, uh, of our budgets towards maintenance of our assets. Um, so, so we are just having a hard time keeping up. We are looking for efficiencies. Um, we are, for, when under our transportation programs, we are um, trying to spend more of our time and effort and, and funding on low cost efforts to preserve what good things we have in good condition um, so that we can slowly build the network back up over time by keeping what we have in good condition and then slowly uh, addressing the, some of the bigger challenges, the bigger dollar reconstruction projects um, as, we, as we can, and then, and then again, keep, keep a little bit of money on them to keep them in excellent condition. Uh, so we are, we are attempting to drive that, that process, but it's really hard, um, r really hard boulder to get out from under with, with just the, the roads are naturally just deteriorating faster than we can address them. It, it, it is never ending. I have a farm and the road to my farm goes by creek and up and down it, and it's always, always in need of repair and they repair it and then they repair the repair and then it, it, it's hard. Mr. French, what steps is the U.S. Forest Service taking to speed up regulatory hurdles and are there any regulatory burdens mandated by Congress that impair the service's ability to efficiently maintain their infrastructure? Okay, thank you. Um, as I spoke before, um, one, We've put together a comprehensive um, capital improvement strategy, a long-term transportation strategy, um, and a deferred maintenance strategy, because we don't want to just spread the resources. We want to hit the right things in the right places. Um, secondly, we're looking at the processes we use to make sure that work happens on the ground, whether it's through uh, contracting, um, whether it's through design and looking at more effective design or through our environmental reviews, trying to make sure that we're doing that in expedient ways. It's also about project management. 
having the right resources in the right places to get the work done and not just sort of go on forever. Um, that's what we're doing on our end. In terms of Congress, I think many of the ideas that have been talked about here, uh, looking at the needs of the agencies and then looking at the way um, this program essentially is, uh, feeds its money through, uh, through federal highways, and then the amounts is something that is worth taking a look at. It can create some delays, and I, and, and I would assert that the, uh, the amounts are maybe not commensurate with the needs. How does the Forest Service coordinate between the local, state, and federal levels, and what can be done to improve those lines of communication? The gentlewoman's time has expired. Um, Thank you. Ms. Brown? Mr. Brown. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, the Baltimore-Washington Parkway uh, is an important regional artery for over 63,000 daily commuters from my district and around the state of Maryland. Commuters rely on the BW Parkway to get to work and school every day and are more often than not subject to unsafe road conditions as a result of years of neglect. Uh, the BW Parkway has become notorious for its potholes and traffic jams. Last March, the situation got so bad that the Maryland delegation had to appeal to the National Park Service to conduct emergency repairs on the parkway, and we are thankful uh, that those repairs were made. However, these repairs were a Band-Aid, and it's only a matter of time until we're back to where we were last March. Throughout this process, it's been unclear to me how the Park Service prioritizes roads that experience high volume uh, traffic within its jurisdiction. Data that my staff received from the Park Service back in October uh, indicated that the agency assesses the BW Parkway in a state of good repair with 0% of the miles being in poor condition. Anyone who drives down the parkway regularly knows that this is an inaccurate assessment. Between 2015 and 2019, the BW Parkway only received $15 million in funding from the Federal Lands Transportation Program. Uh, this is in stark con contrast to the $55 million in FLTP funding that went to Blue Ridge Parkway, the $52 million uh, for Natchez Trace, uh, and the $26 million that went to Foothills Parkway. According to NPS data, the BW Parkway carries considerably more drivers each day and yet uh, is getting a fraction of funds from this program. In an attempt to address this disparity, I, along with Chairwoman Norton and some of our colleagues in the National Capital Region, have introduced the Commuter Parkway Safety and Reliability Act. Uh, our bill directs the National Park Service through the federal lands transportation program to prioritize high commuter corridors. Uh, this legislation would ensure that FLTP funds within the National Park Service's jurisdiction are prioritized based on parkway use. Uh, Mr. Reef, um, could you please tell the committee how the National Park Service currently prioritizes these funds and why parkways that see a high number of commuters each day aren't receiving uh, a greater percentage of the FLTP funds? Yes, sir, thank you. Um, the, the, the Park Service, um, with their $284 million per year, um, first distributes those funds um, to, the, to each region. And th those distributions are based on the, the inventory within each region, the condition of, of the roads within each region, and visitation data within, within each region. So that translates to approximately Oh, and I'm sorry, and highway crashes in, in, that, in, the, in the region. Let me ask you then, so I, I hear some uh, two criteria by region, highway crashes. Does the department consider the rate of daily traffic when priority when yeah, prioritizing? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I misspoke. It, not visitation, it's VMT, visitor, visitor, vehicle miles traveled. So, so yes, sir, it, it does. Okay, does, um, it, does, the, so does the department have a long-term plan to deal with the deferred maintenance backlog of parkways that see a high rate of... Uh, commuters? Well, uh, what the money that gets down to the regional level, which in, in the, the National Capital Region is approximately $23 million per year, about 9% of the overall whole, that the region then prioritizes um, within its needs based on um, asset criticality and, and uh, condition of, of the assets and a few other factors to, to determine where, where they want to put that Fairly small sum of money. And then in terms of the, the allocation to the regions, is that based on um, daily uh, commuter volume? 
That is one of the factors. Yes, sir. To go to the regions. To go to the regions. And then within the regions, that's another factor. Within the region, that is, that, that is a factor to distribute money to the region. And then within the region, they look at all of their assets and determine how, how to. And with just a little bit of time I have left, uh, can you tell me what metrics the Department of Interior uses to determine if a parkway is in a state of good repair? Yes, sir. The, the pavement condition rating is what the Park Service uses for, for measuring state of good repair. They have a, automated, a vehicle that has a number of sensors on it to measure rutting and cracking and roughness and a number of other things. Just a yes or no question. Yes, uh, have you uh, been on the Baltimore Washington Parkway recently? Uh, not in the last year or so since we've had the emergency fix. Okay. I invite you to travel that and see if reality matches up with uh, the assessment. I, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. It's been 18 years since this committee last had a hearing on tribal transportation needs. It is long overdue. So I wanna thank you so much for holding the hearing, granting the request of Congresswoman Davids and I that we have a hearing focused on tribal infrastructure and transportation needs. It's important that we hear directly from tribal leaders on their needs and priorities for reauthorization of the surface transportation bill. Transportation infrastructure is critical for our tribal communities, including the 22 tribal nations in my state of Arizona. A modern transportation network that fosters economic opportunity, helps tribal members reach their jobs, aids emergency personnel, connects vast distances between tribal communities, and transports children to and from school. The transportation infrastructure needs of our tribal nations are great. Many of the roads and bridges are a barrier to greater economic opportunities in our tribal communities because they need significant improvement or repair. This past summer, I had the opportunity to visit the Navajo Nation and see firsthand the significant transportation infrastructure challenges the nation is facing. The Navajo Nation has more than 11,200 miles of roads, over 27,000 square miles, making the nation first out of all BIA, BIA regions for road miles. The vast majority of these roads, 86%, are unpaved. Unpaved roads create numerous challenges, especially in adverse weather conditions for members of the Navajo Nation, whether getting to school or work or ac accessing critical services like healthcare. At current funding levels, the nation estimates it would take approximately 116 years and $7.9 billion to meet their current transportation infrastructure needs. Let me repeat that, 116 years. That's unacceptable to everyone here. Like the Navajo Nation, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community is also experiencing significant infrastructure challenges. Years ago, the community was on the outer edges of Phoenix, but now it is bordered by our rapidly growing communities impact, impacting traffic throughout Salt River. Hundreds of thousands of vehicles travel through the Salt River community each day, placing great strain on the tribe's ability to maintain and keep these roads safe. The federal government has a trust responsibility to tribal nations, which includes providing the resources necessary to ensure the transportation needs in native communities are addressed. Yet, despite this trust responsibility, Salt River receives only a tiny fraction of the federal funds it needs for maintenance and construction. While the FAST Act took important steps to help address the significant transportation needs and disparities in tribal communities across the country, more work must be done. We have an opportunity in the upcoming reauthorization bill to build on the progress in the FAST Act and make sure tribes do receive the resources needed to address these urgent needs. Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent to include in the record letters from the Intertribal Association of Arizona, the Navajo Nation, Salt River Pima Indian Community, and the Gila River uh, Indian Community uh, into the record to discuss in more detail their individual needs. So ordered. These letters highlight the transportation infrastructure challenges and priorities of the tribes in Arizona for reauthorization. One of the recommendations I have heard from tribes in Arizona and others across the country is the need for an office of self-governance at the Department of Transportation to oversee and implement the tribal transportation self-governance uh, program. Mr. Garcia, you addressed this earlier. I made the same question then for Ms. Clark. I wanted you the opportunity to address this issue. You mentioned the importance of establishing an office of self-governance within the Department of Transportation. I couldn't agree more. In, in the proposed rule for tribal transportation self-governance program, 
the department stated that it does not foreclose the possibility of establishing an office of self-governance at the department at some point in the future. The department stated it also believes that a tribal self-governance advisory committee may provide important information to the department as it implements the program. Uh, Ms. Clark, could you explain why establishing an office of self-governance and a tribal advisory committee are so important to the tribes for this new program? Yes, it is important to the programs because it's establishing a new self-governance way of working with tribes directly with USDOT and tribes. And if half of those just all of a sudden when the June comes and wants to enter into a contract, then um, USDOT needs to be off and running. And right now it's not. And so that would be very helpful. And um, the advisory could help guide the um, self-governance. Thank you. I'm out of time, but I, I will be submitting a question as it relates to funding challenges that our tribal nations face that may not be directly uh, proportional to what state, city, and counties uh, face as it relates to matching funds for federal programs, and I'd like to get an answer on the record for that. Thank you so very much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. Ms. Davids. Thank you, Chairwoman, and uh, I'd just like to uh, associate myself with uh, Congressman Stanton's uh, comments earlier and also say thank you for making sure that this hearing happened so quickly after uh, we requested um, requested addressing these important topics. Um, so first of all, I think that listening to my colleagues today, it's um, and then the testimony that I've heard today, it's that much more clear to me that uh, the, the issue of tribal transportation and the tribal federal government uh, to government relationship is, is something that m more of us in Congress and also more of our staff need to understand and have a deeper understanding of. And that includes the relationship of territories to um, the, the federal government to territory relationship as well. And with that, I, I would love to, uh, Mr. Reef, earlier you mentioned uh, a list of the process for decision on investments. You mentioned a, a number of things, cost, um, the criticality of a project, the condition of assets, the consequences of not completing a project. Um, I didn't hear you mention the input of tribal governments in that listing. Can you talk a little bit about the role of the conversations that happen between uh, your office in that decision making and the tribes that are impacted by those decisions? Thank you for the question. Um, I am, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has that role, so I, I don't have a lot of direct role with, with uh, interactions with, with tribes. Um, we can provide some information for the record. Okay. That would help. Because it seems as though when you're listing out the, the various pieces of the decision making, cost, criticality, how do the people who are impacted by this decision, like what, that should be a line in there. Um, and that actually leads to a conversation about the self-governance and also self-determination of tribes. Uh, I know I already mentioned this, but there's a tribal government to government relationship. There is also a federal trust responsibility that I know my colleague, Mr. Stanton, already mentioned as well. And when we're thinking about that, Earlier, Mr. Garcia, you mentioned that if the funding, uh, whether it's formula, percentages, no matter what happens with any funding that we're doing as the federal government with tribal governments, that that might need to be reevaluated. And when it is reevaluated, that tribes need to certainly be at the table. Uh, I know that through the long history of the relationship between the federal government and tribal governments, that has not always been the case. but. Could you talk a little bit about the role of um, not, just, not just consultation as a method of informing, but consultation in the true form of making sure that tribal governments have a real say in, in not just projects, but also how funding happens with the federal government? Thank you for the request. Um, uh, I sense that uh, English is a, is a kind of a weird language, and so consultation is just one word that's been used um, more frequently, but 
Uh, I consider the other word, which starts with the C, as a better word that I think is is probably more implementing, more partnerships, and that's called collaboration. And so, in this case, that any time the the federal government has initiated an effort to improve Indian country conditions in Indian country, funding whatever it may be, healthcare. Uh, in, the, in the past years, the Indian community has been left out. It was almost like somebody else knew better what our needs were than we did locally. And so that piece has changed drastically. And the big implementation part of it occurred in, in 1975 when the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act was passed. Therein lies the roots for opportunities in terms of the tribal governments in this country are also governments, and they know better how to, what their needs are. They know better how to implement programs. They know how to run the programs more efficiently than anyone else would. And the, the conditioning that tribes had faced prior to that is the old um, format about, okay, the federal government knows better and the BIA knows better, and so, it was proven wrong by virtue of implementing the Indian Self-Determination Act, and that's what self-governance is all about. So it's extended through BIA now and through Indian Health Service, but the extension now we see happening is through the Department of Transportation. So therein lies the, the root opportunity for tribes to also do something that they know best in their own country, in their own land. And so if the resources are then provided by virtue of the partnership between the United States government and the tribe, every tribal nation, then we have fixed a large portion of the root cause of the problem. And so we're headed in the right direction. So that's why the tribes are so um, adamant about ensuring that the FAST Act is reauthorized and that the the old FAST Act, I call it old because it was passed in 2015, uh, gets implemented and gets put in place uh, in June of this year. So thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you Councilman. And has expired. I appreciate, I appreciate your indulgence. Of course. Back. Of course. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair Norton, and to all of the witnesses that are here uh, to date. Uh, the plight of the indigenous peoples and the dire need for bold federal investment in our tribal nations is personal to me. That's part of why I recently joined the Natural Resources Committee. I, reg I, I regret to submit that it's been far too long since this committee conducted a meaningful assessment of the infrastructure needs of our tribal nations and the U.S. territories as well. I want to especially thank Chairwoman Norton and Chairman DeFazio for taking up this matter. And uh, Madam Chair, I ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record two government accountability reports that explore the dire need for infrastructure investment in our tribes and territories at this moment. So ordered. Thank you. Tribes continue to receive a fraction of federal assistance that states get in much needed transportation funding. Right now, 574 tribes compete for the same inadequate pots of money. 574 tribes compete for over 505 million in tribal transportation program funding uh, to complete all of their transportation infrastructure needs. The same amount of tribes are forced to divvy up 30 million for transit funding. The same amount of tribes have to work with just $15 million in safety grant funds. There are over 42,000 miles of Bureau of Indian Affairs roads and about 14,000 miles, as has been pointed out, of tribally owned roads, most of which are not even paved. These are literal dirt roads. We have left our native brothers and sisters high and dry. We must do better. President Clark, I understand that even the 
modest plus-ups in funding for some programs are often nullified by the harmful effects of the obligation limitation deduction, which permanently removes tens of millions of dollars from the critical funding programs for tribes. Can you help me and members of this committee better understand the mechanisms of this deduction and how we can make changes to best support our indigenous brothers and sisters? Thank you. Um, yes, in the past four years of Fast Act, let's say, um, that was an um, increase of, uh, um, what was it, $45 million step increases for the past four years. Your obligation limitation took $147.5 million. So really, we are back backpedaling. And so the obligation limitation was exempted all the years up to the safety lieu, um, and then it started implementing the obligation limitation. So kind of for a uh, looking at it is, let's say in 2019, we received 495 TTP funding. 49, 49 million of that went to obligation limitation. So that, in, that left us with 446 million left, which is only 12 million more than 2009 after obligation limitations. 12,000 more, or 12 million more. So it does affect the, the, the um, TTP funding, and if we get that exempt, we could help put that back in the field to help the tribes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And what can Congress do to improve pedestrian and road safety on Indian reservations and in Alaska's native villages? Could we be collecting more cash, more crash data, pardon me, enable education grants, and consider tribal set-asides in federal grant programs? Yes, uh, Ms. Clark. Um, yes. Um, the crash data and data out in Indian country is very uh, vague. There's, it's collected by all sorts of means, the um, law enforcement, IHS, um, state, county, federal, and it's, so it's scattered, and so it's not a complete database, and so we need help on getting and collecting data, and plus the education for safety. And if we could lower the threshold or even the matches for 100% federal funding for uh, our safety, um, projects, then that would be very helpful out in Indian country so that we could have safer roads. Thank you so much uh, to you and uh, Mr. Garcia as well. wonder if we're related, uh, Mr. Garcia. Uh, <laughs> and of course, to all of the panel that is here to shed light on the uh, tribal communities as well as the territories. Thank, Thank you so you, much, Mr. Madam. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Time's expired. Ms. Plaskett. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Commissioner Petty. You mentioned in your testimony the severe cuts that the Territorial Highway Program has endured since 1998, when the formula for apportionment for the Territory Highway Program was scrapped. Instead of continuing to receive a percentage of the highway funding, um, the allocation for the territories was frozen at a flat dollar amount, and that continues to this day. As a result, the Territorial Highway Program's share of overall federal aid highway program funding has progressively declined, and as you said, by 50%. Um, would you share with us some more details on the impact that has had on the state of repair of transportation infrastructure in the Virgin Islands? How far have um, road repairs in the Virgin Islands fallen back, and what has been the impact on the local government's finances? Okay, yes, uh, it's definitely had a negative impact on our finances. Uh, we've had to use our federal funding in creative ways, like floating Garvey bonds, and which then has a negative impact because that debt service comes directly from those uh, same transportation funds. So in, right now, we have a 15-year debt service on one of our projects that basically cuts our $16 million allotment in half. Mm. That's tremendous. Yes. Um, and when you talk about road repairs <clears throat> and the need, um, how long has it been that you've actually created a new road, done more road work? Uh, since I've been a, a brand new road, we haven't been built any new roads. We've been reconstructing old roads, 
No new roads has been built. And how long have you been That's involved? A, I've been there 22 years, and we've never done that. So no new roads in the 22 years that you've been there, the, just repairing? Just repair. There was one project that was a 30-year project that actually got built on St. Croix, which, is, which was the Christiansted Bypass. Okay, great. Well, not great, but thanks for the information. Yes. <laughs> um, it's not just residents of the Virgin Islands that use our transportation infrastructure. There are certainly many visitors to the islands. So when we talk about um, the usage of our roads, it's not just the 100,000 people in the Virgin Islands that use it. How many tourists, on average, um, at our highest point of tourist visits would, would there have been? Uh, we've uh, peaked at 2 million passengers a year in uh, cruise passengers alone. So uh, the, the tourist activity can go anywhere between 2 to 3 million just by the overnights as well. Um, we also have a very heavy uh, transshipment uh, activity that goes on that definitely impacts our infrastructure as far as the amount of uh, heavy equipment on the road. So you, when you talked about that transshipment, you mentioned in your um, oral testimony to us that uh, of the U.S. exports outside of oil and gas, um, the Caribbean is the fifth largest exporter um, that the U.S. does. And of, so that means that a large amount of that is actually transshipped through the Virgin Islands, correct? That's correct. And yes. so that then is heavy equipment, um, barging, other kinds of ex issues. Yes, exactly. Yes. That, uh, so, you know, when we think about how we allocate this funding, it's interesting because among the territories, we're split equally. But the division, and not to cast aspersions or, you know, try to fight, and, and, Madam Chair, I hate uh, that the territories seemingly always have to fight over crumbs among themselves and we end up in a competition with each other. But our needs are very different. Yes. Um, and one of the other things you talked about um, is the fact that we are a ferry system location, right? People live on multiple islands, um, and it takes uh, between St. Croix and St. Thomas, let's say. We know that we have ferries between St. John and St. Thomas. What is the distance and, the, and the, how long does it take, and what is the kind of vessel that's needed to go between Oh, we islands? need a, a very uh, seaworthy, vessel, uh, strong vessel. Um, the waters between St. Croix and St. Thomas are very deep, one of the largest trenches in the world. And it takes right now probably two and a half hours from one of our private uh, companies to get to, uh, in, into Ireland on a boat. So, um, and that is a federal highway, correct? It is a federal route, yes. So I know that I'm co-sponsoring with um, the dean of the house, Don Young, on legislation with regard to ferry systems. And how will that impact um, individuals' lives if you do have a ferry system? I mean, uh, what is the kinds of things that you would have going between the islands, and how does it affect the economony? Definitely uh, boosts our uh, inter-island commerce, um, the activities that happen inter-island on a governmental basis as well. It's uh, on a daily basis. I travel almost to uh, inter-island on one uh, service provider that's not able to su supply the needs of the, the community in, in a way that uh, a ferry service could. Thank you. And before, uh, Mr. Reef, if you could very quickly, what are some of the causes of deferred maintenance in the National Park Service? The Virgin Islands has a total of 46 million in deferred maintenance costs. Thank you for the question. Well, I, I briefly mentioned earlier that we have only half a percent of our appropriations are, are attributed to um, maintaining our roads, rather than or our, our, all of our infrastructure. Um, as, as you're probably aware, as, as infrastructure is sitting out in, in, in the elements, it deteriorates over time on its own. Even if we don't do anything to it, it will destroy itself. Or the weather will destroy it. Uh, and as it, infrastructure ages, it it uh, is more expensive to repair back to the original condition. I, I'm beyond my time, but um, what would be the percentage then that you think it should be, you should be utilizing? Uh, and the then I would yield study back. study that I referenced in my testimony um, from the National Academy of Sciences indicates 2 to 4 percent is recommended for federal facilities. Uh, I thank the gentlewoman. The, this 50 percent reduction she, she uh, indicated uh, is particularly outrageous to have a formula. That, you know, nobody got increases, but the notion of allocations going down, particularly in perhaps the most vulnerable part of our country, uh, parts of our country surrounded by water. So I want to assure the gentlewoman that the committee is looking closely at that. Thank you for your leadership on that as well. The last, uh, oh, no, it's not. We have two more me me members. And next would be Mr. Johnson. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I was looking at uh, the Trail of Tears. I Googled the Trail of Tears, and I saw where, uh, you know, untold numbers of uh, Native Americans were driven out of the Southeast uh, United States pursuant to the um, an act passed by Congress, uh, the Indian Removal Act in 1830. And I don't know how many Native Americans lived in the country uh, in 1607, uh, but I'm told it was around 30 million or so. Uh, but today we're dealing with 5.2 million people who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native. Uh, 570 some odd tribes stretched across 100 million acres of land, which we refer to as Indian country, uh, scattered among uh, 34 states, I believe, and uh, roughly 157,000 miles of roads um, providing access to Indian land. And uh, in the, in, uh, Native Americans have uh, been handled uh, uh, yeah, very badly in this country, treated very badly since 1607. And um, 1830, when the Indian Removal Act was passed, that was during the height of the uh, slavery uh, period in this country. And, uh, and it's just the, uh, the regional parts of the United States in Alaska were high. Everything that's related to the project follows that uh, reality. Well, if you're elsewhere in the country, um, you, you follow the rules of the local economy, if you will, in terms of pricing. I, I understand. And, well, and so I, with that, uh, the I other see. factor, important right. one, sir, is really important is the location of the tribe and where the project is being held. Well, I'm going to run out of time in a second. I want to ask you, the, the problem is with uh, the threshold being so high for projects that get priority, it leaves out a lot of smaller projects that really need to be done. And uh, is the $25 million threshold for funding tribal projects more of an impediment uh, than it is helpful? They, if that number were a little bit larger, uh, would be helpful. Uh, if it stays at 25, then you're limited in what you can uh, uh, progress with. And so the number of uh, projects that are available with that amount uh, go down uh, with the uh, cost of the project. So, All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Let me ask this question of uh, Mr. Reef. Mr. Reef, Georgia has over $48 million in transportation-related uh, deferred maintenance needs at sites managed by the National Park Service. Uh, 1.2 million of that total is at the Martin Luther King Jr. Historic Park in Atlanta, which honors the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This unneed, unmet need translates into diminished visitor access at this cherished site. Can you tell me what your department is doing to improve visitor access so that the public can view these historic landmarks and appreciate the history contained within them? I, I thank you for the question. I don't have that information in front of me, but I can provide something for the record. Thank you. With that, I yield back. Mr. Johnson, I'll, the last member to, uh, to ask questions, we will hear from at this <coughs> time. Mr. Napolitano. Holding up the rear. <laughs> yeah. I have uh, uh, said through this a little bit, I didn't hear all of it, uh, I've been on natural resources for 21 years, so I have a, an idea of how the tribes are treated as well as the, the territories, and they are second class citizens as far as Congress goes, unfortunately. Uh, uh, I'm wondering whether... Uh, uh, the BIA talks to each other, all the agencies that handle Indian Affairs, do they talk to each other about how to address the shortcomings and funding of uh, needs? 
Uh, the, the, the needs are provided by Congress, so I don't know that there's a lot of um, discussion about how to, amongst the, the, the various agencies, about how to, how to address different numbers. How many agencies cover Indian Affairs? Uh, I'm aware of the Department of Interior has Bureau of Indian Affairs. Bureau of Indian Education is a separate bureau. Um, the Department of Transportation has agencies that deal with, um, well, not a separate agency that deals with Indian Affairs, but uh, they have components for, that deal with Indian tribes. Uh, Health and Human Service has Indian Health Service. Um, that's the only ones I'm aware of. There may be others. Well, do they ever talk to each other? Do they ever meet to find out what, how they cover the needs of the tribes? Yes, ma'am. My understanding is they do, they do meet together to talk about. How often? I, I, I don't know that. Well, uh, it just, it's just uh, unfortunate that uh, we are only dealing with this part in transportation here, whether you have needs and, and other agencies. But we need to um, make the tribes aware if the tribes are not able to uh, uh, get the funding because larger tribes get major part of the funding, maybe there's got to be a way of uh, uh, getting all the small tribes together, medium-sized tribes and large, and have the same seat at the table to be able to advocate for their needs. Mr. Garcia. Well, um I have two minutes to answer. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, there is, um, have you heard of the Tribal Interior Budget Committee? Nope. Uh, that is a, an organization that was formed by efforts of the tribal nations of this country whereby we knew that we were not being consulted and we were not discussing the needs of, true needs of Indian country. And so the Tribal Interior Budget was formed uh, some time ago, I think it was in 2001, 2002. What do they, what do they discuss? We talk about the funding uh, elements for all programs within the Department of Interior that's related to tribal only, funds. Only Interior, so, what are tra transportation and health? We, we do that for uh, Department of Interior and we do that for the Indian Health Service through the HHS. Now, we have not done that similar thing for Department of Transportation. But I think now that the, um, that was another reason for requesting that a Office of Self-Governance be formed as part of the Department of Transportation, then there would be an, another uh, element that would help us to uh, discuss more closely, collaboratively, the needs of Indian country in terms of infrastructure and what the Department of Transportation can do, and that leads back to the funding sources, well, uh, uh, which is congressional. Is short, so but I would ask think that's where we're headed. Ms. Blaskett and the uh, chair to maybe uh, do a joint hearing, including the territories, because they're just as hurting from funding. And uh, when I look at the report as, as, uh, that what Mr. Perry submitted, it's, it's criminal. They're not, they're ignoring the needs of the, the territories as well as Native American uh, uh, pueblos. And I think that we ought to start focusing on, maybe we can get the Research Bureau to give us information so we can talk intelligently and get other agencies to come in and, and do their part. Madam Chair, I, re, re, I yield back. I'm too uh, upset. Uh, we'll be glad to consider uh, uh, Ms. Napolitano's request. Uh, are there any further questions from members of the subcommittee? Seeing none, I would like to thank all our colleagues, but especially our witnesses, for your very helpful testimony today. I think you could, you could, see, you could hear from the responses of members of the committee that members uh, were often hearing what they have not heard before. Your contribution to today's discussion has been very enlightening and very helpful to us. I therefore ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing from the members of this uh, subcommittee. And unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days
for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered, this hearing is adjourned. I was looking at your tongue and you hit it right on. I went, I went overboard on it. I tried. I, I knew I could get away with it.